Hi Brendan, can you hear me? Yeah, I can, yeah, I can hear you. And you can see my uh, holding slide, right? At the moment, I can't see your OBS. No, I'm, no, just, I'm, just, I'm just setting I'm it up. Alright, no worries. Um, I can hear a bit of background, bit of background noise. noise from you though, and I can, hear, I can myself. hear myself. Yeah, I think that's my settings. I need to change my sound settings. You won't hear it because once I switch to the other audio, you won't be able to hear it. I'm just going to switch back to music. Wasn't the thing that Trinka is. Right, so the plugin in question is away from the OBS website just here. Click the green one, the map that will head out. It does the page.
You can type what you like. Okay. Nakita mo? Okay, uh, morning everyone. Um, thanks for joining us. It's not quite half past nine yet, so we'll give a couple more minutes for everyone to start and then we'll get going.
Okay, it's half past nine, so we'll make a start. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Johnson. I'm a neonatologist in Southampton, um, and I'm chairing this first morning session. Um, hopefully, you've all seen the programme we've got. Um, this is the eighth one of these days we've run. Um, they've usually worked pretty well. Um, generally speaking, we want people to engage and ask questions, so please do um, take those opportunities, particularly during the question and answer sessions. Um, we've got two workshops uh, later on this one this morning and one this afternoon hopefully you've all been allocated one and hopefully that will work smoothly um, but please do let us know over the chat if you've got any problems um, you can see this morning um chris forster in a minute is just going to talk to us briefly through about how in free works and the website we've been set up which is a lot of a lot, a lot of thanks to his work um and how you can all access the courses and things and then we've got Shazia talking about parental nutrition and the risks and benefits of that. Janet talking about human milk oligosaccharides and whether they prevent NEC and whether we should use them. And then Kathy Bittle talking about optimal glucose concentrations in preterm infants. Um, hopefully you've all been given some details of people to contact. Again, if you have problems with the workshops, but we're hoping it works smoothly. I think it did last time. I think that's probably... Uh, all I've got to say, apart from thank you all for joining us. Um, so I will probably move over to Chris um, and we'll get started. If you're ready, Chris. Hello, hi, morning, everyone. I'm just gonna hopefully share my screen. <clears throat> Perfect, well, I'm hoping my screen is sharing for everyone. Um, so, uh, yeah, welcome to the meeting today. Welcome to the N3. So, um, yeah, I think as Mark said, this is um, not our first meeting. I think, um, yeah, we've been running these for a little while now. Um, and I think really, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the N3, who we are, and I think how we're growing. And um, I think what we're, we're hoping to kind of bring for you in the future, really. So, um, so what is N3? So, well, the N3 was formed in 2003, I'm um, reliably told, initially called the Neonatal Nutrition Club. Um, so Nick Embleton and Pam Cairns, who are still on the current N3 committee, um, were um, the founding members as well. And just to make them feel slightly better, um, I, I was at medical school in 2003. Um, so, but they had their, their first meeting in Edinburgh in 2014, which was the first meeting of the Neonatal Nutrition Club. And there they are looking nice and fresh. Um, but I think by about 2009, I think everything was starting to kind of kick into gear. And here they are in Edinburgh in 20, in 2009. Um, so a slightly bigger group. And I think it was around about this time that um, the uh, N3 started really with its support for getting some new, uh, neonatal nutrition focused research trials going. And that close link with research has, has been kind of a present since it was very first formed and was one of the main features of the N3. So well who are we, what are we? Well we meet twice a year and um, we have, have business meetings twice a year but we're now starting to regularly host a second educational day. We had our first um, kind of open winter meeting um, uh, earlier in this year um, and we've always hosted a summer education meeting, which is becoming increasingly popular. Um, and we will often host okay, over 100 delegates now per meeting. Um, just a few things. So we, we don't receive any funding from any milk formula companies. We do, do sometimes get some funding from industry, such as PN companies, just to kind of help make the days run. But we, we don't get any funding from any milk formula companies. Um, and I think just a uh, note to kind of all the people in the faculty and the people behind the scenes and the tech team, just that um, every organiser, lecturer and faculty member um, gives their time freely. So, um, you know, we're, there's no one receiving any payment for today. So um, everyone's putting a lot of effort in. As I said before, the N3 and research very closely linked. Um, I think back in that, uh, that, that meeting 2009, I think was where um, the um, discussions and ideas behind Elfin and SIFT really started to gain some traction. And I think the N3 has kind of helped to deliver those trials along with trials such as Magpie. And um, its role in research is still ongoing today with um, trials such as Feed One and the upcoming Dolphin trial. 
So where are we now in 2002? Well, we now, as I said, we meet twice a year. Um, we're a group of neonatologists, pharmacists, dietitians. So we come from quite a large MDT. Um, we've started to host, so we've always hosted a summer education meeting. Um, always used to be face-to-face -face back in the days before COVID, but we're hoping we're going to get back to that very soon, hopefully by next year. Um, but I think because of the popularity of these meetings, we have now started hosting a, a second meeting in the winter. Um, and so we're now, um, we're, we're now um, regularly have more than 100 delegates and there's, there's over 100, 100 delegates today as well. We're still very active in research, um, both in terms of supporting current trials, but also in discussing and devising trials and um, feeling where the direction for nutrition related research is heading. Um, as we're growing, we are now trying to kind of increase our online presence really, and also increase the resources that we offer. Um, so because I think we now have um, just under 500 subscribers, so 498 subscribers. So hopefully by the end of today, we might be up to over 500. Um, and, you know, our website, which I think is still fairly much in its infancy, is certainly becoming more popular and we're getting over 250 site visits a month. So someone out there must be interested in neonatal nutrition. Um, and we're also getting our quarterly newsletters out. I say quarterly newsletters, I've only sent out two so far, but the plan is for them to be quarterly. So, um, so uh, technically we'll have to wait to the end of the year to see if they truly are quarterly, but that, that's the plan anyway. So, and I hope the people that have received them have found them vaguely interesting and informative. So I think there's been a lot going on with the N3 in terms of trying to kind of reach out and um, be slightly more uh, networking, certainly in these days where we're not quite able to do it face to face. <clears throat> but I think we kind of want that N3 website to really kind of facilitate that networking. And I think, um, you know, networking was the thing which brought the N3 together really, and which is what has kind of started it to get to where it is today. So we'd really like that N3 website to, to be the first stop for most nutrition resources or certainly signposting to where you may find the stuff that you need. Um, but I also think it'd be really nice if we could use that website as um, a way to kind of stimulate discussion between professionals on what current trends are in nutrition, different practices, research proposals, those kind of things. So trying to think about how we could do that. Um, and of course, our aim is to continue to support ongoing or, or new research in the field of neonatal nutrition. So this is our website. I'm hoping and expecting most people will have seen it, given that you've registered for the event today. Um, but I think just along the top there, I think there are main kind of areas at the moment, such as the kind of meetings and research, but also the resources section. So I think we do kind of in within the research section, just kind of keep um, keep abreast of what current trials are ongoing, what new trials are coming up. Um, and I think there'll be a bit of information there on the dolphin trial in the coming, coming months as that starts to get going. But I think within the resources section as well, we've got quite a broad range of things now really in from everything from breastfeeding in terms of guidelines, links, um, you know, uh, access to uh, important papers and bits of research within the field of nutrition. So certainly within enteral nutrition, parental nutrition, so links to guidelines, um, position statements, S scan stuff, um, and then metabolic bone disease as well, supplementation. So current kind of positions on probiotics, fortification, um, position statements on metabolic bone disease. So there's a lot of resources on there, um, but I think, uh, oh, and of course there's our Twitter feed, which, um, is uh, yeah ever present but I think what we'd really like is to facilitate that website kind of growing and developing so so there's been a lot of work on it over the last kind of six to eight months but it is very much in its infancy and the website really is designed for everybody anybody who is interested in the field of neonatal nutrition and I said if there's a way that we can facilitate that discussion um, one of those things would be whether or not something like a members only forum would be something that would be useful um, and that may be something where we can post questions and queries that people may have either for a response from someone else on the forum from the N3 um, committee um, whether uh, if there's any discussions or thoughts about 
the new research, new evidence has come into line, new guidelines, um, comparing practice, um, or would more resources be more useful? So things like hospital guidelines, seeing what other people are doing, um, more literature, different areas of neonatal nutrition that we've not covered in those resources. So I think although there's a lot of stuff on there, I think there's a lot of stuff which could be on there. And certainly setting up something like a forum may well be really useful and really interesting, and especially if it gets um, uh, some discussions going and uh, can pose those questions to N3 members. These are just ideas. Um, they're my ideas, um, but uh, they, I would be really, really interested to hear what other people think and what people would like from the N3 website. So as we've heard, the N3, it's not new, but it is certainly developing and we're certainly growing. And the number of people who are attending our days and who are signing up to the website is going up quite quickly. So um, we'd like to make that website for you guys. We'd like to make it more engaging. So I'd be really grateful if anyone's got any ideas or thoughts that they'd like to see on that website to either get in touch with me directly or through the contact form on the N3. Um, all of them come to me anyway. Um, so, but yeah, it'd be really lovely to hear from everybody. I think that's all I've got to say is a brief intro to the N3 and what our hopes are for the future in terms of our online presence. Um, so I think I'm done now and I'm going to hand over to Shazia. Hi everyone, hopefully you can hear me now. Um, thanks Chris for um, a really good introduction to what N3 is all about. Um, so I'm Shazia, I am one of the neonatal consultants in Cambridge and uh, lead for neonatal nutrition on our unit. I'm just trying to get my screen to share. I'm hoping that you can see it um, and then get it so that I can see it as well. So uh, yeah, is we, that visible we, Yeah, we can, we can see that perfectly, Shazia. Yeah, Great. that's fine. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, so the title I, we came up with was Risks Versus Benefits. And when I stopped to think about it and the time that's allotted for it, I was like, oh my goodness, how am I going to fit all of this in? So I've tried to kind of take different aspects of risks and benefits and do a short piece on each of them. And I'm going to try and keep us to time because we're early in the day and we really want to keep things um, moving forwards properly. So in the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to try and cover a little bit about why we need to take the risk. And that really goes around the goals and benefits of PN in neonatal care. A little bit about how we use PN and the practical issues and some of the risks and benefits around that. And then risks associated with PN itself, the system, the recipe and for the patient. And then a little bit about finally how we maximise benefits and minimise risks going forwards. So this little girl um, was born in Brazil and she has been on many memes across the, um, the internet over the last little while. But she struck me as being somebody who really kind of said what um, was happening to a baby around the time of delivery. Up until that point, they've had a really good maternal fetal nutrient supply um, and it's really been the ideal source of parental nutrition for them. Well, in most cases, as long as the placenta is working well. Um, Beth then interrupts that and you can see how cross she is. She's like, don't you dare cut my cord. And then they cut the cord and she squawks. Um, they've interrupted her nutrient supply that she's been getting from the placenta that's kept her going all of these months. So what we're trying to do is provide nutrients in the same way that we're giving all the up to all nutrients, so total parental nutrition, um, IV rather than um, relying on enteral nutrition. In reality, providing that um, total parental nutrition and matching what was being provided in utero is very hard and that's particularly difficult for preterm infants and that's related to their immaturity and we'll come on to that. So usually actually what we do, although people talk about PN, but TPN, we really want to work towards PN. So we're trying to give it alongside enteral feeding. Um, and there's good reasons for this, both in terms of gut development, for growth and function, and also protection from some of the side effects and the hazards of parental nutrition. And one of the things that has been around for a while is minimal enteral nutrition as part of that gut protective treatment and overall 
approach to nutrition and maintaining and developing our preterm infants and their ability to cope in the outside world. So since the 1970s, really, um, we've been able to have PN available uh, to, um, to use. And its primary aim has been to achieve adequate nutrition in order to achieve appropriate growth. That's really what we're trying to do. And that's still the point of PN. For term infants, we know that if they don't get good nutrition, um, they become quite catabolic quite quickly. And within the first week of life, they really are going to be in a catabolic state and really um, not thrive. And we'll start to see that across their growth charts and then across their behavior and their biochemistry as well. For our extremely low birth weight infants who, uh, who are um, a larger proportion of our neonatal workload than they were 10, 15, 20 years ago, they really only have sufficient energy reserves to support two to three days of life. And there's strong evidence that the nutrient intakes in early postnatal life in, have a, a lifelong effect on their cognitive outcomes. So this little girl was actually the first baby to that we know of that received PN. She's a little girl who was born at three and a half, uh, three pounds, um, five ounces. And in six weeks with PN, she was about the seventh patient to ever receive PN. She got up to six pounds, five ounces. And so it has been around for a while. And what we've learned over that time is that while we're providing macronutrients and essential fatty acids, micronutrients, electrolytes and minerals, it really is a team effort to get this right. So this is the first um, risk as far as I can see <clears throat> in thinking about um, PN. So we know that we've got different parts that we're gonna talk about, but this really is quite a complex um, system and pathway that if we're trying to provide PN, we need to make sure that we're doing it properly. Um, and you can see it goes everywhere from thinking about it, assessing what the baby needs, um, ordering it, making sure that the pharmacist can, uh, has checked it and made sure that it's compatible and that what we're producing is or what we've asked for is actually achievable and stable. Then we have a whole team of techs who are doing the compounding and preparation. We've got the dispensing PN who've got to make sure it's labeled and delivered and it's stored properly and has the appropriate um, protection around it. And then we've got all the other bits in terms of documentations and now in e-medical records or e-prescribing -pre -e that we need to do to make sure we can actually give it to the baby. And then we have to monitor to make sure that we're giving the right things in the right way. And all of this is quite complex. When it was looked at um, in 2010 as to um, use of PN across the UK, we, the survey that was undertaken by the NZPOD showed that up to 20% or more than 20% of hospital patients receiving PN were actually babies in neonatal units. And that was quite striking because it sometimes feels as though neonatology and neonates in general are a bit of a forgotten population when people are planning hospitals and hospital services. Um, and things like getting um, PN availability hadn't really been appreciated that we needed such a large proportion of what was available. But what was sad to see was actually the nutritional care that was um, assessed at that time showed that there was a, a need for or room for improvement in the clinical care around nutrition in over 40% of the newborn patients. And those related to things like de delays in recognition for need of PN, delays in administration, things not being documented in the patient record properly, and um, the initial prescription actually not being sufficient for what that baby needed at that point. And so we now have to look at what we, ha what we have to have in place to ensure that we are providing PN properly. And that includes safe prescription, safe preparation and administration of PN. And that requires our multidisciplinary team to really be skilled and staffed. And over the years, we've moved from having a surveillance at what we're doing towards recommendations, both from Espagan and from NICE, as to what we should be putting into our TPN, how should we be approaching it, and what systems we should put in place. 
And some of the systems that we need to think about are training and updating all staff in all aspects of PN. I've worked in, I'm very privileged to work in a service where we've had PN for a long time, but we're very clear that our staff turnover and changes in junior doctors and nursing staff um, means that we really need to be keep our eye on the ball in terms of making sure everybody is trained and really knows what's going on. We've moved towards using standardized bags. This has increased the availability of PN and reduced some of the risk around manufacture and preparation errors. And the other thing that has been recommended is that we have local and regional guidelines and make sure that we undertake regular audits of practice, both to make sure that we are um, prescribing appropriately and are doing all the other bits in terms of system, system um, practice. But this is really important, whether we're actually reaching the nutritional target that we've set for this baby. And that's something that I think we need to clarify as to what those nutritional targets need to be in the future. So moving on from that, some of the other recommendations is really to identify who we're going to give PN for. And there's varying um, recommendations depending on which country you live in, depending on which um, a group of experts have discussed this and what information was available to them and the consensus they came up for. But these kind of can be divided into the absolutes and the potentials. So we've got babies who clearly can't have enteral feeds because they've got congenital um, GI disorders and are needing surgery for that and so are unable to get to feeds. We've got a group of babies who are not able to tolerate enteral feeds or absorb their feeds, and those babies who may have short bowel syndrome or may have malabsorption. In the neonatal population, we know that necrotizing enterocolitis is still a real risk and a real disease that although we're trying many options to um, improve care and reduce that at the incidence, it's still a significant disease burden. And we know that um, these babies need bowel rest for a prolonged period to allow the colitis to settle before we can reintroduce feeds. And so for that, we need to be able to provide PN. And then we have also over the last five to 10 years, again, had a larger group of extreme preterms and extremely low birth weight infants, where we're using this bridging nutrition as as a support for them as they develop their functional gut maturity um, over time. We've always known that for the very low birth weight babies and the moderately um, preterm babies, and that's still a potential group where bridging nutrition is important, but we have to think about the risks and the benefits in a slightly different way as to the extremely low birth weight um, infants. There's also babies where just for whatever reasons going on, we, they're clinically unstable and we can't give them um, feeds in a way that will get them onto enteral feeds in, in a rapid and appropriate fashion without leaving them with a large nutritional deficit. And there may be babies who have a temporary feeding intolerance that they can't, uh, they can't cope with large volumes of, P of enteral feeds and so they need PN in the background. Ultimately, the practical side of this is really stopping and thinking when you look at a baby, whether they're going to achieve adequate enteral nutrition within five days. If not, they're going to have a significant deficit and we really need to think about putting PN in. And the smaller your baby, the, the shorter your time interval before you're going to start developing that deficit. So you would want to bring that five days down to three, two or even one day. So moving forwards from there, we have um, timing for starting PN. And so we would want to start as soon as possible from when we've made the decision. And we're trying at the moment from NICE, following the recommendation to introduce fees, uh, to introduce PN within uh, eight hours of making the decision. That's to minimize the nutritional deficit, which we are really worried about and is a real risk to these babies, but also allow for safe placement of, then, of um, central lines. We then have to start thinking about how we're going to increase our PN and looking at the risks and benefits around options for introducing PN and whether we step it up gradually or whether we do that in a more um, kind of full on way to start with. So when you talk to, um, or I, I say senior, I'm probably one of the seniors now looking at the amount of gray hair I have. And um, when we talk about nutrition and why we introduce TPN in a particular way or PN in a particular way. These are some of the things that when you ask the question, this is what you're told. You're told it improves tolerance if we give it slowly. We're mimicking the gradual increase in nutrition as a, as a baby would experience when they're ex in establishing lactation. It allows us to check that they're um, tolerating lipids and we're not developing glycemia. It allows to monitor the glucose tolerance. Um, and 
that actually there's no real advantage to giving it any quicker than that. So of all of those things, um, I think the, there's, an ev there's very little evidence base, that, a strong evidence base for any of those things. And it's become a standard practice to increase um, PN gradually, but there's not a, a strong evidence base for this at present. When we talk about mimicking um, the nutrition experienced by lactation, actually the vast majority of babies who we're, um, we're working with and providing PN for have low stores and they're not really metabolically, metabolically equivalent to our term infants. So we can't really mimic what they would be doing and we're taking them out at a different point in their development from the uterus and trying to support their nutrition beyond that. We don't know what the normal or safe or desirable even um, triglyceride levels are for a preterm infant on intravenous lipid. It's been extrapolated from data from older patients and brought down. And many units have had arbitrary cutoffs for urea and triglycerides. We're not sure what that means and what actually that that relates to in terms of the clinical relevance for our patients. So we may be putting in barriers to babies getting a nutrition or sufficient nutrition that don't need to be there. And that's a risk to us. Glycemic control is improved when we're giving amino acids. So this point of um, monitoring tolerance of glucose, actually your alternative for many of these babies is to just give them dextrose infusions. And that's probably going to be worse for their glycemic control than starting them on PN. So we can refute that one. The one that stands out a little bit more is um, the one around uh, um, no reported advantage to early introduction of maximal um, enteral, um, uh, sorry, maximal parenteral amino acid and lipids. Sabita Ataya and her group um, undertook some work in the neon, NEON trial in 2016, and they actually showed no improvement in growth by starting early and also possible harm. So even when we think we're doing the right thing, we have to have that wet, watchful eye to make sure we're not overdoing stuff. Too much of a good thing, too much of something can be bad for you. So evidence for introducing full PN straight from the beginning. So we know that um, early PN is well tolerated. Um, and we can see that from some studies, there is a benefit and there is evidence that actually we can improve nitrogen retention and provide higher en energy intake without increasing metabolic acidosis or metabolic derangement. And we can provide um, a better uh, early nutrient supply um, and um, improve anabolism and growth with this as well. Um, but it improves the conditions. But what we're lacking still is the long-term outcomes um, and seeing what this does um, in terms of our babies. So should we be going for the slow and steady approach or should we be speeding ahead? And we don't have an answer to that yet. There's more evidence coming out that we need to be more cautious um, and the work that's come out through the Pepinet group, um, which was uh, based in PICUs as opposed to mainly NICUs and is from three different countries, um, from Belgium, Netherlands and Canada. I put the flags up there just to remind me, I'm hoping you know which one's which. Um, so we had 209 term infants who were less than 28 days and they further divided those to um, infants who were less than a day old and less than a week old. And what they looked at was whether they should provide um, PN within those first few days or whether it would be later on uh, towards a week of age. What they saw was a trend but not significant um, reduction in, PIC, in infections in the PICU when they did a multivariate analysis. The babies who had their PN introduced later had a, had a trend towards having a lower instance of infection. And there was significant um, reduction in their duration of PICU stay and mechanical um, support when they were given PN later. But that's, that's counterbalance. So when we're starting to think, okay, our term babies who are sick in a, a PICU setting, so potentially in a different group to our neonates who are um, early preterms um, or late preterms who are needing that support in a different way, the term babies tend to be sicker, they might have surgery or other stresses going on. Um, this group were at higher risk of having hypoglycemia if they got their PN late. And, in the babies who couldn't get little or no enteral nutrition, they had an instance of hypoglycemia of about 53%. There was also a difference in the protein dose. So even if you give it early, there's a diff uh, there's caution around um, what kind of PN and what the formulation should be. 
So um, a higher average protein dose was associated with a poorer outcome, yet a higher lipid dose was associated with an improved outcome. So we have to think about our formulations and getting it right for individual patients. Hot off the press, the Vita's team have also been doing work looking at um, data from uh, the National Neonatal Research Database and collecting data from 65,033 babies, looking at similar things in terms of whether we should be um, initiating parental nutrition for very preterm babies either early, so within the first two days, or after the first two days. And we have had a shift towards early PN over the last 10 years or so. Um, and this is really checking to see whether we're doing the right thing or whether we should be concerned and need to look at it in more detail. So their main outcome measure was um, looking at morbidity free survival to discharge and secondary outcomes were looking at survival to discharge growth and other core neonatal outcomes like BPD, ROP um, and putting all of that data together. Their findings, um, there was no difference in their primary outcomes between early and late PN administration. The early group had higher rates of survival to discharge. However, they also had a higher incidence of other, um, uh, other uh, comorbidities. There was also uh, another thing that um, came out through this data was that the babies who were given PN earlier appeared to have a greater drop in their weight in their Z scores between birth and discharge, which was an interesting finding. At the bottom there, you can see that the babies who died in the first two days, there were only um, a small number or a small, small percentage who received PN. So it's not, it's not a clear signal that early PN is um, related to an increase in mortality, but there's confounding factors and survival bias, which may influence these, out of these findings. And so we need to look at our data again. So I've talked a bit about when to introduce um, PN and what we should be doing about it. I've got a few other bits that I wanted to talk about. One is around catheters. Um, so we can use PN peripherally to start with, where um, introducing or in, inserting a central catheter might um, delay introduction of PN. Um, but there are quite a lot of concerns, and most of these are familiar to you working in the neonatal um, field. Infection is always a worry, and we worry more about translocation in our surgical babies, um, occlusion, extravasation, and the dread of cardiac tamponade, and the, um, the frustration when we have accidental removal or damage of a line as well. The other thing we have to be aware of is compatibility. It's a complex mixture that we're using and altering one component can have effects on other components and the solubility of other components and the stability of the solution. But we also have to think about what other drugs we're giving. And there are charts available and, and your pharmacy team should be able to give you um, clear information that's ex easily accessible within the neonatal um, unit to be able to see what we're giving, whether it's useful, compatible and safe to give alongside PN. The bigger things when we're thinking about it as clinicians often is the metabolic risks. And I've put these in different colors just to show that there is a rainbow of problems and um, that we can have. So there's hyperglycemia, azotemia, volume overload, overload hypertriglyceridemia, although we're not quite sure what that means. Hyperbilirubinemia is a theoretical risk as well. And there's the worry about trace element deficiencies and toxicities. If you're needing PM for a long period of time, then we need to be really clear that some of the things that are in low levels in that PN are going to, you're going to get longer exposure and or a longer absence, for example, of iron in PN, which we need to consider in the long term um, and make sure that we're putting in measures to support our babies and our formulation is appropriate for them. The other thing that we all, um, I have to look at carefully is the electrolyte imbalances. Quite often um, PN was blamed for acidosis and it was blamed on the amin amino acids but actually when you look at it and a piece of work that we did um, in Cambridge showed that actually the chloride load and the electrolyte load is often from the salts um, in medications that are being given and from high volume high volumes of saline being given as flushes. Each of those little volumes of half a mil to one mil to two mils if you're giving those for, for drugs three to four times a day and accessing um, arterial lines as well, will add up to 20 to 30 mils per kilo of boluses of saline that have been given during the day with a significant say, um, sodium and chloride load. 
other than us giving it, most of the imbalances are because of excessive losses, because of renal immaturity, because we've got problems with the GI tract, um, or we're giving diuretics. And we need to really be very careful and measure um, these um, losses and make sure that we're replacing those electrolytes appropriately until uh, the baby reaches a period of stability. And then we can reduce our um, the frequency of our monitoring, but we'll still need to continue it. And then the high levels of calcium and phosphate that can result from either excess or inadequate intake respectively. And we know that we're dealing with a group of babies who are at high risk of metabolic bone disease. Um, and so some of the work that we need to do is making sure that the balance that we're giving and the ratios of calcium and phosphate in the PM that we're providing alongside enteral nutrition gives sufficient um, substrate for um, bone development and bone health. So all of these, you can see that I put in there as well, there are things that we can do that might help. But our biggest worry in the longer term where babies, once we've got that, we've got approaches for managing some of these things. One of the things that really concerns us in the longer term is PN associated liver disease. And when I talk to um, our team about what are the risk factors of um, using PN, this is the one they usually jump to. Um, quickest rather than thinking about all the other risks and all the other worries along the way. So it's actually something we see in babies receiving PN for over 14 days. Some studies have said that the key number or the key day is around 40 days where we see a, a much higher incidence thereafter. And we see a range of liver abnormalities um, of steatosis, um, hepatitis, cholestasis, cirrhosis, and ultimately portal hypertension can be associated with this. The incidence can be between 40 to 60 percent and those babies um, with up to uh, with intestinal failure, there's an incidence of up to 85 percent. And the process um, is related to all of these different things, so lipid accumulation, the kind of fats we're giving, inflammation, effects of sepsis, phytosterols um, and bile acid transportation being decreased as well. We know that um, we can give PN to some babies and they don't seem to have any problems with it at all, um, but there are babies who appear to be at higher risk. And again, talking about the risks and benefits, we need to think about the risk factors. And the data shows that it's the preterm babies with low birth weight, and as with many things in the neonatal unit, male babies have an increased risk of developing this disease. Um, it's associated with prolonged associated, uh, exposure to PN, enzyme deficiencies, there may be genetic and other anatomical factors that um, contribute to it. But this is the bit we need to think about a little bit more. Factors relating to the PN composition, and this is an area that we'll need to think about in the years to come. We know that um, using soy-based lipid emulsions have a higher amount of omega-6 um, fat, fat, uh, fatty acids. They've got higher levels of phytosterols and lower bioavailability of vitamin E, which makes them more pro-inflammatory potentially to the liver. High glucose loads are also known to have an inflammatory effect on the liver, as well as potentially causing other complications around the body. Amino acids and photodegradation of what we're putting in um, can potentially exacerbate liver disease. And we talked about um, trace element toxicity. So aluminium and chromium are two of those which we need to think about. Every time a baby gets an infection, it has an effect on their hepatic function. That's often Lyme effect related, so it can be a vicious circle. And we worry about bacterial overgrowth and Im immature immune function. We can minimize the risk though, um, by introducing and advancing enteral nutrient feed in nutrients whenever possible. And this isn't a new concept. We've known about this for a long time. And um, back in when I was um, uh, just finishing medical school, um, we were already looking at this and understanding the importance of enteral nutrition and using PN really as a supplement to that. And there's work that's being done um, in formulations to use mixed oil lipid emulsions. There's evidence um, that it can reduce um, PN associated cholestasis and liver disease, but it's not a clear absolute that it can prevent it, it may reduce it. 
But what is coming now is um, the use of fish oil based lipid emulsions to treat this disease. There's limited data avail availability on the feasibility of using this in the long term and for all babies because it may not meet the essential fatty acid requirements of our very preterm high nutrient requiring um, babies. But this is an area and this is a treatment that is now available alongside the use of versodeoxycholic acid in babies who are on enteral feeds. So that's where I'm going to um, pause for breath and say that this is what we know so far. PN is an essential treatment in neonatal care. It's benefited millions of neonates across the globe since 1967. We need to be aware of the potential risks of neonatal PN alongside those benefits and using it cautiously within our units. And we need to develop safe systems for ensuring the provision and monitoring of PN by skilled, highly trained staff and safe provision from um, the time that we decide that we need to use it all the way through to the time that the baby receives it and the time we step down from it. In the future, as Chris said, part of the work that we do in N3 is looking at what we can do to improve things in the future. And we need to increase our understanding through collaboration across the N3 and research that we um, all agree is important and vital. And these are some of the areas in PN that we could look at. So the timing of starting, the composition to improve neurodevelopmental and neurocognitive outcomes, uh, um, of the, uh, the composition of PN to support growth and minimize hepatic injury, and optional ops, sorry, options for monitoring to maximize the benefits and minimize risks of PN use. That's all I had to say. I think I've run over by a couple of minutes, but um, it is a big subject to fit into 25 minutes. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Charles. Yeah. Um, uh, and you're all right. So just pretty much bang on 10 past 10. So. <laughs> that's a relief. Um, that's very much. Uh, um, please do everyone put your questions in the chat because um, we're going to have a question and answer session at the end of this session. Um, and next I'd like to introduce Janet Barrington, who's going to talk about whether HMOs prevent NEC and whether we should use supplements. Thanks very much, Janet. Can somebody confirm that they can see my slides? Um, I can see your PowerPoint, but not your slideshow. Well done. Okay, hopefully now you can. Yeah, that's yep. perfect. Okay, marvellous. Uh, so thanks very much for the invitation to, to talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about whether human milk oligosaccharides prevent neck and then uh, whether there is an option for us to actually think about supplementing babies at high risk of neck. Uh, so this could be the world's shortest talk because I go from a title to a thank you slide, but it's not. There is uh, more to follow. Uh, but I just want to thank Andrew Massey, who's one of our PhD students, uh, who has done both much of our HMO work um, and also uh, provided much of the graphics uh, that I'm going to share with you. And some of what I'm going to share with you is currently unpublished. So they are identified on the slides, but I'd be grateful if people don't photograph or screenshot those uh, slides and that data, please. So uh, Shazia touched on the burden of neck and why we might use PN, but I think it's always worth uh, just stopping and reminding ourselves what that burden really looks like for our littlest babies. So this is NNAP data from 2020, where six and a half percent of babies were recorded as having experienced at least one episode of neck. That's 417 infants in that one year alone. And that compares really quite well to what Sift and Elfin showed. So in a research cohort, sub 32 weeks or sub 1500 grams, same sort of incidence, so 5.3 and 5.6%. And if you look at the table on the right, you can see how that incidence is affected by the birth gestation of the baby. So if you're a very immature baby below 24 weeks gestation, you have around a one in four risk of developing NEC at any point in your life. And that falls off really quite dramatically to less than 1% in the most mature of our immature babies. And it's also true that the risk of either surgery or death is highest in those most immature babies. So you can see that around half the babies who do develop neck, if they're be below sort of 25 weeks, are needing surgery or dying from their neck. And depending on the series of, of cases that you choose to look at, you'll see that death as a result of neck is uh, quoted as between 10 and 50 percent of cohorts. And as I say, it depends which cohort you choose to look at. It's not just about death, um, but it's also about the impact on the babies who do survive their neck. And we know that the neurodevelopmental outcome after 
necrotizing enterocolitis is worse than in babies who experience either meningitis or bacterially confirmed sepsis. And then there is, of course, this big cost to families in terms of stress and time spent in hospitals, and that translates to financial burden to the NHS of millions of pounds. So not surprising, it's something that we continually turn to to try and think about how we can prevent babies developing neck. So there are some things that we know impact on the neck incidence, and some of those we know uh, reduce neck if we do it well, so giving babies antenatal steroids, giving babies breast milk, ideally mum's own milk, but also donor milk, using our antibiotics judiciously. So for most of us, that means using our early antibiotics for short duration, but there is some emerging data perhaps suggesting that some early antibiotics might be better than none. Optimal management of the cord at delivery for preterm infants, use of probiotics, and thanks to Boost, we know that running babies with slightly higher oxygen saturations reduces death and neck uh, incidence. There are some things that we know don't impact uh, neck incidence, which we had hoped might. So SIFT has shown us very nicely that how we increment feeds once a baby's initially tolerating their milk doesn't impact on neck incidence. And the deliberate supplementation of bovine lactoferrin also does not have an impact on neck incidence. And then there are some things that we know actively worsen a risk of neck, uh, specifically for us, reflux treatments in the preterm population. So just coming back to this uh, fact that breast milk and specifically mum's own milk reduces neck incidence. It's one of the places where we've looked for things that we could then intervene on and to try and understand the mechanisms by which that protection uh, occurs, which still are relatively unclear to us to date. But that's where human milk oligosaccharides come into the thinking. So human milk oligosaccharides, for those of you that haven't come across the concept before, they're complex sugars, and I'm going to show you how their structures are built, but they are present in many different types within breast milk, and they're made by different women in different proportions, and some women can make some, and other women make different oligosaccharides. They're very abundant in human breast milk, so they're the third most abundant solid component, so away from water, and they're most present uh, in earliest breast milk. And they have many functions or many potential functions in the baby gut. So they act as a prebiotic, they promote intestinal development, they stimulate maturation of the immune system, and they protect against pathogenic infections in the baby. So they're quite complex in how they're assembled. So they're assembled from these five starter monosaccharides. So glucose, galactose, N-acetylglucosamine, fucose, and N-acetylneuramic acid. And they are then assembled into a backbone of disaccharides. So those disaccharides are LMB and LACNAC, and of course, lactose. And they're assembled, as you can see, from the three constituent monosaccharides. So we start with a, with a beginning point where we've assembled a disaccharide structure. And then by these other mechanisms, we can add the other monosaccharides to that beginning structure. So by silylation, we can add new 5 ac and by fucosylation, we can add fucose. We can then elongate those structures so we can add those disaccharides to each other. And if you add them in different ways, you get either elongation or branched structures, depending on where you choose to add that next disaccharide to. And then to those more complex structures, we can again silylate or fucosylate in order, oops, sorry, in order to develop more complex structures. So you can imagine that if you keep thinking about where you could then add a fucose or a silic acid residue or how you could branch or elongate, you can see why there are so many different varieties of HMOs. And women have different capacities to do these different steps. And that's why different women produce a different HMO profile in their breast milk. So the other key thing about the HMO is that it isn't food for the baby. So the breast produces it um, in these large quantities, but the baby itself cannot digest human milk oligosaccharides. So when we think about breast milk composition and the macro and micronutrients, these three key constituents that are food for the baby, protein, lipids, and lactose, and then this other key constituent, which is actually food for the baby's gut microbiome. And they are made of these human milk oligosaccharides. So what about these and their potential role in necrotizing enterocolitis? 
So like many things, the first step was some animal work, which suggested in a rat model of necrotizing enterocolitis, the HMO profile was important, and specifically that this one key HMO, DSLNT, appeared to be neck protective in the rat model. Aritrin's group then looked at that in human preterm infants. So this group have a cohort of babies in whom they have breast milk through this baby's course and in whom eight of those infants develop necrotizing enterocolitis. So first I'm showing you the total HMO profile of each mother's milk in relationship to whether the baby remained well, which are the gray blobs or developed neck, either spell stage one or two and three, which are the red squares and the yellow diamonds. And what you can see here that is that there's a very convincing no difference between the total HMO availability in maternal milk and whether the baby develops neck. But if you then look at this very specific HMO, DSLNT, you can see quite a different story. So you can see here that the babies who go on to develop neck have less DSLNT in maternal milk than the babies who remain well or who developed Bell stage one neck. So that's data that would support the animal model hypothesis. If you look at how um, important that is, you can see a very important reduction in neck with the highest levels of DSLNT. So they're a very significant reduction in rates of neck in infants who have high maternal levels of DSLNT. And if you look at this other HMO, LSTB, which is structurally extremely similar to DSLNT, but lacks this one final silic acid residue here, you can see that there's no impact on the neck rates. So it appears to be something very, very specific to this very specific HMO. Many of you will know that in Newcastle, we've got a, a biobank of uh, samples from preterm infants that's now uh, 12 years old and has many thousands of samples. It means that we can look at larger cohorts of infants with specific diseases and especially with NEC. So from that biobank, we were able to select samples from infants who developed neck and match controls for gestation and postnatal age and look at milk and stool preceding the development of neck. And we're able to ask the same question. So we're able to say, is the profile of HMOs different in maternal milk in infants who do and do not go on to develop NEC? And you can see that of all the HMOs we're able to look at, there is no difference in levels with the exception of this one specific HMO, DSLNT. And we're able to do exactly the same analysis. We're able to look at the levels in maternal milk before development of neck. These are time matched in infants who don't develop neck. And you can see that the maternal levels for infants who go on to develop neck are significantly lower than in our healthy control infants. We're then able to look at a cutoff rate where we believe that a certain amount of DSLNT will protect against neck. And we're able to demonstrate that the levels are different in babies who develop medical neck as well as develop surgical neck. So from this, we established a threshold level of DSLNT in maternal milk of 241 nanomoles per mil. We're able then to test that in other groups, and we find that the same predictive effect holds true. So remember that these HMOs are feeding the gut microbes. So because we also have stool from these infants, we can then look to see whether what we believe is the mechanistic impact of the HMO on the stool and on the baby's gut flora is actually seen in our cohort. So again, some of you will be familiar with this technique where we look at the total bacteria present in the baby's stool, and we ask um, a computer algorithm whether it can cluster those stools into particular types, and it chooses the optimal number of types. So in this case, there are five preterm gut types with different bacteria predominating in each of those different gut types. We're then able to track those gut types as time passes and in the infants in the run-up to the development of neck. And we can then separate those uh, infants by infants who do and do not have DSLNT in their breast milk above or below the threshold. So this is testing the hypothesis that the HMO in maternal milk is driving a change in the gut microbiome, which may be part of the mechanism of development of neck. And you can see very nicely demonstrated that the infants where we have high levels of DSLNT so the milk levels above our threshold progress very nicely through these uh, gut enterotypes and end up in a very nice, healthy, mature gut enterotype. Whereas infants who have low levels of DSLNT sort of get stuck. They're not very able to progress down. And you can see very many less frequent transitions to this nice, healthy, mature 
gut enterotype. So in terms of thinking and a story so far, we've then been able to show that there is an association between this one specific HMO, DSLNT and neck. We've been able to show that in animals, in two specific human studies with uh, infants with neck, but still small numbers of infants. So one of those with it's eight, not nine neck infants, I apologize, and 33 of our own neck infants. And this idea that there might be a threshold level of appropriateness of DSLNT in maternal milk. And then we've been able to take that one step further and show an association between DSLNT and the infant's gut microbiome. But then perhaps the other questions are, well, what about the breast milk microbiome and how does that relate to the HMO? And do these bacteria actually grow differently in uh, different human milk oligosaccharides? And then we'll move on to think about whether treatment is a real option at this stage. So these uh, are data um, on the breast milk microbiome of those same infants. So these are the same infants in whom I've shown you the other data. And you can see control infants in green and the neck infants in red. And there are lots of different ways that we can think about and present the data on what bacteria are present in the breast milk. So we can look at the total uh, number of different things that we can identify. We can look at the diversity. We can look at individual different bacteria. We can plot the total uh, bacterial uh, presence. And I think that you hopefully are convinced that the red and the green bars in any of those measures are really extremely similar. So we do not appear to have a different breast milk uh, bacterial profile in these infants. So the things that we're observing don't appear to be driven by differences in the breast milk bacterial profile. So the other thing that we've been able to do is to take a specific bacteria that we can isolate in our own infant stool. So we know these are preterm specific infant uh, organisms from the baby's stool. And with access to human milk oligosaccharides, we can then try and grow those bacteria in the presence or absence of one specific HMO. And what we can see then is that uh, in the presence of these different HMOs and the specific bacteria that we can test from our babies, we can show a difference in growth between different bacteria and presence or absence of specific human milk oligosaccharides. So then we end up with something like a, a, a heat map that you might be familiar with. So the very pale squares are where the bacteria does not utilize the specific HMO. And the darker squares are where the, where the bacteria does utilize and grows well on that specific human milk oligosaccharide. So just as example curves here, you can see that, for instance, uh, this Clostridia is growing very, very beautifully in the LNT here, whereas uh, this B. bifidum does not grow in the presence of 2F. So when you look at DSLNT, you see something that's a wee bit surprising to us, which is that many of the bacteria that the babies have are not capable of utilizing DSLNT, but B. bifidum and uh, very interestingly, a Clostridium is able to utilize DSLNT. So again, we have uh, the capacity to take this thinking a little bit further. So we have uh, the preterm organoid or enteroid model uh, in Newcastle now. So we're able to salvage uh, gut from our preterm babies who go to theater and need resection for a clinical indication. And then we're able to extract stem cells and grow organoids, which are preterm specific. So these organoids will come from infants at 24, 25 weeks gestation. And in the same way that we can add a, a specific HMO to um, a bacterial growth medium, we can expose an organoid to a specific HMO. And then we can look at various different things about that organoid. We can look at the things it produces when we provoke it with various uh, external stimuli, and we can look at its genetic profile. So uh, these are just examples of what we've, uh, what we've seen in terms of differences and, and the impact of exposure to those HMOs. So these are enteroids, so three neck and three control enteroids exposed to DSLNT here and then LNNT here. And I think you'll be convinced that if you look at the controls and the neck babies uh, here for DSLNT, that there is a differential uh, change in gene expression in those enteroids in the presence of DSLNT in the infants who do and do not have neck. And those uh, genes, we can then look at and see what behaviors are, they're coding for. So we can see changes in response to stress and carbohydrate metabolism. 
So again, further evidence that there is a mechanistic process underlying this uh, observed association with DSLNT levels. So finally, what about supplementation? Um, is it feasible? Is it likely? Uh, so there might be two ways that we could think about doing that. One of those would be to supplement via breast milk. So because we have uh, donated breast milk available in this country, we could screen those donations and we could look at milk that has the highest DSLNT levels. And we could look at using that specifically for the early feeding in those most vulnerable babies. So those babies with a, with a neck rate of, of one in four uh, for the most immature babies. Or we could look at externally supplementing in the same way that we did with lactoferrin. So we could take manufactured human milk oligosaccharides and we could supplement those into whatever the baby's diet was. That currently is, is difficult and costly, but uh, manufactured HMOs do exist. We don't really know what the correct dose would be. So although we have a threshold, we don't actually know um, what the dosing would, would be or should be like, and we don't really know how long we might need to supplement for. And in terms of looking at endpoints for those uh, early studies, it may be that we did need to look at a microbiomic endpoint because a clinical endpoint in the beginning would be would be highly unlikely to be achievable. And I think we all need to, to take some caution and learn some lessons from what we learned from the lactoferrin study, which is that the extraction of a single breast milk constituent in addition uh, just of that one constituent may fail because there may be other things that that one constituent requires in order to be functional for that baby. So are there any data? There are, but they're all term uh, trials and they're all um, trials with endpoints that are very difficult for us to uh, extract into our preterm population. So there are trials of supplementing uh, term formulas. Uh, so the first trial is, is marriages trials. So it looked at supplementation with 2FL, used a relatively low calorie uh, formula that was supplemented um, and they showed growth rates that mimicked the infants who were breastfed and uh, lower TNF alpha in the serum of infants who received TFL, uh, 2FL supplementation. But that's uh, term infants. Similarly, uh, supplementation with 2FL and LNNT, again in term babies, showed similar growth was achieved and well tolerated. And there were some microbiome measures in that cohort. Um, an interpretation of the change in the microbiome from the supplementation was that it was being driven in a more breastfed direction so that formula fed infants had stool it resembled more closely what you would expect to see in a breastfed infant and then that last study which had five HMOs supplemented to term infants again was really a, a tolerability uh, study but well tolerated with with no change in growth between babies who are supplemented or not there is to the very best of my knowledge uh, no term no preterm data sorry uh, looking at supplementing uh, with HMOs in a preterm population so my take home messages for you are that they probably do play a part in net development in some babies, but it's extremely unlikely to be a simple magic bullet because they will not be the main driver in some babies with NEC. And it may take us a long time to actually work out the ideal and optimal uh, HMO supplement and dose and timing and all of those details. We have some fascinating data on twins where one does and one does not develop NEC who are breastfed. So they obviously have the same mum breastfeeding them. Uh, and the milk that the infant who, who develops NEC receives has lower DSLNT levels. So there's some complexity beyond uh, what's in the mum's breast milk. We should all, however, be striving to give all of our babies as much maternal milk as, as fresh as possible to maximise their access to their own mother's HMO. And obviously this group specifically understands the value of research in this population. And thank you very much. I think that's all I have to say. Thanks very much, Janet. That was fascinating. Um, hopefully, people have lots of questions for you in the um, in the session uh, at the end of this um, morning. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to our final speaker of this session, which is Kathy Beardsall from Cambridge. Um, she's going to talk to us about optimal glucose concentrations in preterm infants. Excellent. Thanks, Thanks Mark. Much, Kathy. Thanks. I will look at sharing share screen. See if I can do that. Okay. You want to go with that one? Can you see the screen? 
get it right. You can see your PowerPoint screen. And now your slideshow, that's perfect. Thanks. Can you see it the right way? Yep. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Um, let me just do a switch for me. Can you still see? Just I'm fiddling with my screen. Still see the right screen? Yeah, that's fine. That's good. Okay. Right. Thank you for asking me to come um, and discuss the somewhat controversial area of uh, optimal glucose control for preterm infants. Um, I don't promise to have all the answers, but um, hopefully it'll provoke some discussions. So, moving on. Hopefully move on. No, move on twice now. Hang on. We should have a slide with current. My slides are doing silly things at this end. Yeah, we've still got the title page here. You've still got the title page. Oh, and mine skipped on two. <laughs> Sorry, bear with me. It's okay. It's now decided to crash my computer. But I'm still here, but I've got a blank screen. Right, let's try again. I don't need love technology. It's always a race. Uh, well, well, we've well, been well, doing so well. Right, have we got a slide two? Uh, no, we're still seeing definitions. First. You might you might need to unshare and reshare because we're still seeing oh. first um, okay. slide from before. And it hasn't changed. Hasn't changed. Okay. Well, we're sorting out our technical issues. This is an excellent opportunity for everyone to post some questions in the Q and A. Um, as Christine has just reminded everyone in the chat. Uh, okay, yeah, we've now got definitions table. We've got definitions. Excellent. Let's hope we can move with that. Okay. Let's see what's what I've got. Um, okay. We want that there. Okay. I've not got my. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, it did move then. Uh, so mine is much, so I've not got the same as you at the moment, which is a little frustrating. Um, I guess the other thing you could do is if you could um, email the slides to our AV team um, and they could post them up for you. I don't know if the AV guys on the line could um, direct message you their email address and then you could send them across. Yeah. Um. Kathy, Kathy yeah. you can send the, it's Christina here, sorry, you can send yeah. your uh, slides to me and uh, I'm with Rakas so we can uh, put them up for you. Okay, let me do that. Ugh. I don't know why my computer is playing silly, I've just... It's okay. It's no, happened to everyone. Like... <laughs> no, no, it's not supposed to happen. Well, it's so fine this morning when I looked at it. And we had meetings all day yesterday and they all went fine. No, I think it's um while we're waiting, I don't know, Christina, if you wanted to say anything about the workshops now that's gonna work this afternoon. Oh, and well, after coffee, in fact, at Bulbast Eleven. 
Thanks, Mark. Um, I was going to to keep that for the end, but um, uh, of this session. But yes, we can have the chat now. So, what's going to happen during the break and the Q and A session? We uh, you will all gradually being allocated to your workshops. If you have any issues or you cannot see your workshop, then you uh, please um, message me or Rakas and we will make sure that we can sort it out. Um, through the chat, Rakas can pick it up and he can do the allocations, but it should be quite smooth because we have allocated everybody to their workshops. Um, so it should be happening um, during the break. Thanks. And who do people, which, which um, of the Zoom guys is it? Is it the N3AV they need to message or the yeah, AV yeah. tech they should message? Uh, it's either. Yeah. Either is fine. Either. So They're if you, anyone me. has any problems, you can direct message either of the AV people that are on the Zoom chat. Um, and I, even if I pick it up, I'm, I'm in the same room with Raka, so we can, uh, we can sort that out for people. But hopefully it will work. Beautifully. I'm sorry, I can't even get into my emails at the moment. I'm gonna, I'm just shutting everything down to start again. Kathy, would that would that help if you do after if you do your talk after the break, or yeah, would you why have don't to I do that? Just give me. <laughs> would you have to go? I, I wonder whether Nick. Um, Nick Embledon can share his slides if he's still. I I can do the talk if I can do my talk now. Is that alright? Would you mind, that? Nick, and please, then we can please, sort please, out. Apologies um, for casting. being very useless. That's okay. Um, no, yeah, I'm not... gonna log out and then I'm gonna log back in again and see whether that helps. But apologies, yes. Nick. That's fine. Um, we we can work around that. It's absolutely fine, Kathy. Um, okay. you can share the slides with me as well, and I'll then do that. Will be in the meantime, after. I will. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, in that case, we're we'll slightly change of program. We will hand over to Nick. Um, who's we're move, kindly going to move his talk forward to now. Um, he's going to talk about bio nutrients in milk opportunities and challenges. Thanks, Nick. Um, you can see that, okay? Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, just some conflicts and disclosures. Nothing um, uh, very uh, unusual there. Um, but just to note that I have sort of worked with um, commercial companies as well as government funders. Um, and just to kind of start off by highlighting, of course, brass milk is the most important intervention in neonatal nutrition. It's probably the most cost effective. It's certainly better than probiotics. Um, as you know, it improves brain uh, outcomes, better white matter growth, less neck, etc. It improves maturation of the immune system and it results in better cognitive and metabolic outcomes over the life course. Um, but despite that, most babies in the UK who get neck currently have only ever received mum's own milk. So we do need to think about strategies that might reduce the risk of neck um, in the context of babies who receive in four week fields, even if they're just all uh, mum's own milk. Some of you will have uh, seen this slide before, but this is the kind of schema I use for explaining nutrition um, when I'm teaching, um, and I see kind of nutrition made up perhaps of four different components. First of all, you have your nutrients, which are all your proteins and fats and micronutrients, of course. But then you have these important bionutrients, so the HMOs that Janet's just been talking about, but also growth factors and enzymes and a whole range of other compounds. Then there are the microbial aspects of nutrition. So these might be microbes that uh, appear in the breast milk or that you get from the environment or that might be modulated by probiotics. And finally, this large group of kind of what I've called technical and socio-behavioral aspects of nutrition. So this is things like, you know, which do you use a gastric or a gastric tube? Uh, do you feed by bolus? Um, what about kangaroo care, breastfeeding promotion, taste and sensory aspects? So those are the kind of four elements of nutrition. And when I started doing nutrition research more than, yeah, probably 20, 25 years ago now, um, I'm happy to admit, I didn't really understand um, the complexity of all of this. I saw milk as something that you tipped into this long tube called the gastrointestinal tract, out of which you sucked the fluid and nutrients, and then you produce waste product at the other end. But of course, in the last 20 years, we've learned a huge amount about um, the metabolites that appear in the gut 
all the microbial aspects, the hormonal aspects and the immune aspects. And this has resulted in a paradigm shift um, from us just thinking about breast milk as food into it being perhaps a developmentally regulated biochemical pathway that involves aspects of signaling um, and metabolic control. So what's actually going on in the gut? Well, Janet touched on some of the microbial aspects and the microbial community composition of the gut is very complex. Um, and in preterm babies, it's profoundly different. It's very different from a term baby. And all of these microbes are being driven by um, things that appear in the diet, i.e. the nutrients or the bionutrients. But in turn, all of these microbes are producing metabolites. And the gut microbes interact with the epithelium and will translocate through into lamina propria, um, even in healthy situations, as do many of the nutrients and metabolites will translocate through even into the systemic system, where you have the concept of the gut brain access. Um, so this is a very complex interaction that's going on. And the interaction between your bionutrients, your metabolites and the gut microbes will also depend on what you call the kind of milk matrix. And so this might differ if you've got a formula predominant uh, feed compared to a breast milk feed, but it will be also be different if you change the pH and, and other factors. So the matrix in which all this is happening in the gut lumen um, will also impact on uh, how everything works. So as I say, you can think about it, all the proteins and peptides in the, in the milk diet you're having, but also factors like lactoferrin, HMOs, fatty acids, these all impact on uh, gut microbial ecology or the types of uh, bacterial that you have there. And we know, as I say, that there are important differences in the composition of uh, breast milk to formula milk. And then in turn, all of these gut microbes producing lots of compounds, which are potentially very important for gut health such as short chain fatty acids, um, but also a range of amino acids and peptides potentially. Um, gut microbes also produce bile acids, choline, various vitamins, and they produce a range of anti and pro-inflammatory mediators, along with signaling molecules, which may um, travel to the brain and impact on brain um, activity as well. So this is a very complex um, interaction that's going on. So I'm going to talk about bionutrients from the point of view of, um, you know, what sort of bionutrients could we think about potentially adding to milk that might improve the outcomes? And primarily we're thinking um, from our research group point of view about neck as an outcome. Um, but the same questions would arise in relation to brain outcomes. You know, what sort of uh, additional nutrients could you add to mother's own milk or donor milk? or formula milk that might improve the outcome. And there are lots of possibilities here. And I think there's kind of quite a lot of excitement in this field. And there's almost an endless list of um, bionutrients. So hormones, particularly IGF-1, um, but also epidermal growth factor and insulin. I'm gonna to touch on insulin um, a little bit. Enzymes like a bile salt stimulated uh, lipase, but also ly uh, lysozyme. Proteins like lactoferrin, osteopontin, and capocasein, amino acids, glutamine, arginine, um, and acetylcysteine, non protein nitrogen compounds like nucleotides, immunoglobulins, fatty acids, particularly DHA, arachidonic acid, and choline, carbohydrates, as say HMOs, um, microbes and cells, I haven't really included because I wouldn't really consider them to be bionutrients as such, although, of course, that's how they work, but we're not going to discuss them. And then finally, what I've called kind of multi-component products. Um, so there have been trials using bovine colostrum and there have been some term infant studies using what's called milk fat globule membrane. So I'm gonna use, um, just talk about some of those examples um, in red um, to illustrate some of the issues that we're dealing with here. So how might these bionutrients work? What are the actual kind of mechanisms that are going on? Well, they might have antioxidant um, effects. So we know that one of the ways in which lactoferrin may be beneficial is by its iron binding um, capacity. And when lactoferrin binds iron in the gut, it holds it away from bacteria. And most of your E. coli and enterobacters and your pathogens actually require quite a lot of iron. So this is one mechanism by which lactoferrin um, in human milk keeps babies healthy. Um, other mechanisms might be involving digestive function or motility or even absorption. 
And as I say, we know that many of these bionutrients affect gut microbial community structure. Some bionutrients probably work by um, impacting on the gut barrier. So they may affect the mucus layer and um, tight junctions. Um, there's a lot of work, basic science work, showing that some bionutrients impact on intestinal growth and differentiation. And they may also have anti-inflammatory effects. And then when you think about bionutrients interacting with the lamina propria, we know that some of these will, will affect immune function and potentially IgA production. Um, and then as you sort of travel a little bit further out, you think about blood flow to the gut, um, there is evidence, for example, that arginine uh, regulates intestinal blood flow because arginine is a precursor of nitric oxide. And there have been two small trials suggesting that arginine supplementation may reduce the risk of neck. As I say, there are signaling molecules here um, which provide um, the basis for you know, what's called the gut-brain axis. And again, um, impacts on gut immune function are going to impact on systemic immune development. So there are going to be lots of different uh, mechanisms by which bionutrients might work. And it's likely that even a single bionutrient utilizes many of these mechanisms. Now, I thought that, you know, what happened with kind of breast milk in, term, in evolutionary terms was that, you know, breast milk existed as a food and then bit by bit, um, it was modulated to have greater anti-infective um, activity. But in fact, um, it's the opposite. Uh, breast milk primarily evolved as an anti-infective strategy um, and the food aspect of it came along later. And we know this because many of the proteins that we see in human milk appeared um, or, or were present before humans existed, even before mammals existed. So evolutionary studies show you that, uh, for example, proteins like lactoferrin existed uh, prior to, to humans. And infectious disease really has been the primary driver um, of evolutionary change. So for example, let's say you can find lactoferrin in worms. Um, and I know for a fact from digging them up that worms do not breastfeed. Um, the ability to create lactose from alpha lactalbumin um, appeared about a quarter of a billion years ago. Um, and there's evidence that oligosaccharides may have evolved before lactose. And many of the bionutrients that you find in human milk, you also find in, in amniotic fluid. So these bionutrients that we're talking about have a very ancient um, history. And as Janet showed you, when we then try and think about how, what this means for neck, um, simplistically, we think of this interaction within the gut between the microbes, the nutrients, or nutrients and metabolites, and the immune system. And the interaction between these three that promotes health is different when you're a baby um, to when you're um, older. But for a preterm baby, the gut microbiome is very different and very compromised. Often the babies are born by C-section, they're in sterile incubators, they're touched by hands that are very carefully washed and alcohol gel. We then break the skin uh, by taking blood samples. We put bits of plastic into various orifices. As amazing as PN is, it's a very abnormal way to be fed. Even the breast milk comes into contact with plastic and, and isn't the same as if you were directly breastfeeding. And then we fill the babies up with antibiotics. So it's hardly surprising that the microbiome in our babies is different. And it does seem that the microbiome is a critical factor in the development of neck, that somehow this delicate balanced interaction between these three elements may be responsible for a breakdown in the interaction between these three elements might be responsible for neck. Now neck is, um, should really be seen as the kind of tip of the iceberg of gut health. So neck is the thing that we worry about um, and we code a baby as either having had neck or not having neck. But that really oversimplifies the complexity of gut health and we should be thinking about all the bits that actually exist below the sepsis, uh, below, the, below the watermark. So for example, sepsis, but also some clinical infection. But also we know that all these elements of gut health are going to impact on feed tolerance, nutrient assimilation, uh, the need for antibiotics and long-term growth outcomes. So when we're thinking about bionutrients, we have to be aware that there's a complexity of interaction here, that we're not simply just focusing on preventing neck. So if you were to do a trial of um, uh, bionutrients, what outcomes should we use? Um, neck, unfortunately, is rare. Um, however, one of the challenges in studying is that it's not really a single disease. Uh, so we know that neck, obviously, that appears in the first two or three days, for example, in a baby with cardiac pathology, 
is going to be a very different disease to the kind of more classic form of neck that might occur at three weeks of age in a preterm baby. So we need very large trials. Um, if we're doing smaller trials, we need good biomarkers. Um, there are a few of these around intestinal fatty acid binding protein, urine or metabolomic or cytokine markers, but we really don't understand the relationship to clinical outcomes with many of these markers. Composite outcomes are actually problematic. You see a lot of trials where the outcome might be death or ROP, but they're very difficult to interpret because how many cases of death would you use to equate to a case of ROP or vice versa? So if the trial um, reduces ROP and you have 10 less babies with ROP, but two more deaths, is that a good trade-off? So composite outcomes are always going to be problematic. Um, as Janet probably touched on as well, neck and focal intestinal perforation are very poorly discriminated. Um, we all think we're getting it right, but actually when you look in the badger coding, uh, we're getting it mixed up the whole time. And even if we want to think about brain outcomes um, from a bionutrient trial, uh, we know we're going to have to wait for at least two years to get that outcome. Uh, Bailey 3, as good as it is, is a very crude marker of brain function, and it is unlikely to be um, subtle or precise enough to detect important benefits from bionutrients. Um, so you might need more precise measures of um, uh, psychological progress. Um, and if you really want to study kind of psychosocial behavioral outcomes, we all now know, don't we, that preterm babies show differences in their learning behaviors and education. So you have to have long term follow up. So we do face major challenges when we're thinking about bionutrients and what outcomes we might measure. And um, all of you will recognize this kind of setup, the kind of complexity of, um, you know, a neonatal unit being very busy. And when you think about running trials, you need to be aware of, you know, the time that is needed to, to screen and consent, uh, time for parents to understand and then enroll, and then all the kind of complexities of data collection, who's going to do it, when you're going to do it, how do you check it all, what do you do with incomplete data, um, who's going to approach the parents, what are the priorities, you know, when the NICU's busy, you know, we, maybe we don't have time to recruit for the studies when the, when the unit is heaving. Um, and then thinking about, you know, when you design your trial, what are the inclusions and exclusions? If you've got your research team available 24 seven. And then of course we have variability and attitudes to research and equipoise. Um, and as you know, as many of you know, we're doing the dolphin trial at the minute. Um, and we have to use a supplement that's made by a company that has expertise in producing a safe supplement for preterm babies. Uh, so we are, as I tell you, we're doing a trial on supplemental DHA encoding, and some people have decided they don't want to take part because the supplement is made by the manufacturer of a breast milk substitute. Well, that's going to make progress in this area incredibly difficult, because who else is going to make your supplement for you? Who else actually has the expertise to make something uh, that is going to go into the gut of a preterm baby? So there are lots of problems that we need to be aware of when we're thinking about uh, trials of bionutrients. So I'm just going to give you um, four or five examples here of recent trials, just to give, kind of give you a flavor. Um, so the first is, and we'll talk about recombinant bile salt stimulated lipase. So um, the, the human form BSSL uh, is important for fat digestion absorption, but it is inactivated during the pasteurization process. So you won't find it in donor milk and it's absent in formula. And there was a pilot study of recombinant BSSL that looked quite promising. In this pilot study, they showed that babies supplemented had higher weight gain velocity, um, but they also had greater docose hexanoic acid and arachidonic acid absorption. Um, so this was followed up by a definitive trial published in 2016 um, by Casper based in France, but this was a multinational study. And this was a double blind placebo controlled three um, phase three RCT in infants less than 32 weeks. So a good, important population. They received four weeks of the intervention. So they either got the BSSL or they got placebo and they enrolled 415 uh, babies of whom they, they got follow-up data of 365 to 12 months of age. So a pretty decent trial. Um, unfortunately, what they showed in this trial was absolutely no difference in growth velocity between the babies getting BSSL um, or placebo. They did have a predefined subgroup, which are babies who were SGA, who did appear to show uh, better growth with, with the BSSL. So what you see on the graph here is in the AGA babies, no difference in growth outcomes between those getting BSSL and placebo. But in the SGA babies, 
it appears that they might have grown a bit, bit faster. And there was also um, a higher proportion of SGA babies who were growing more slowly, less than 15 grams a kilo a day. So um, what do we make of that? Is it enough um, that you should change practice and use it just in your SGA babies? I think at the minute we would consider that, that this probably isn't going to be a promising intervention uh, for our babies. So the next uh, binutrient I'm going to talk about is insulin. Um, and as many of you uh, know, insulin is present in human milk, uh, particularly in the first few days, but then it, the concentration of human milk declines quite rapidly thereafter. Um, it's not present in formula. Um, and you might ask the question, you know, why should insulin, which we know is quite a complex protein and it is not absorbed from the gut, uh, what's it doing there? Um, and so basic studies suggest that enteral insulin might promote intestinal maturation. So this was a commercially funded double blind RCT in 46 NICUs where they compared recombinant insulin uh, to placebo. And babies, less, uh, babies between 26 and 32 weeks, greater than 500 grams, were recruited. Uh, they had three arms in this trial. They had a low-dose arm, a high-dose arm of insulin, and then placebo group. And they had this intervention for 28 days. And a fairly decent size trial, 300 infants, average age uh, 29 weeks, birth weight 1,200 grams. So not tiny babies, the typical babies you would see on your NICU. Um, and the study was stopped a little bit early by the DMEC because they were unable to show a difference between the high and the low dose uh, groups of insulin, but not because of any safety concern. And here are the outcomes. Um, so what they showed was that time to reach full feeds was significantly reduced in babies receiving the insulin. So whether they got the low dose or the high dose, they reached full feeds at 10 days of age on average, whereas placebo babies were 14 days. And this was a well-blinded study, so, so these results um, are not, not fudged in any way. They showed no difference in weight gain, NEC, and none of them developed um, serum antibodies. And they did see uh, low PN use in the high-dose group. And then here on the right, you see a kind of um, upside-down Kaplan-Meier, which basically shows you, as you can see, that in the blue and orange, the babies on insulin are getting up to full feeds more quickly. Um, and that by the end of the study here, um, when they did the analysis, there was a significant difference between these babies and the placebo babies. So is this enough data to change practice? The authors in the paper suggest that it might be. Um, I guess a key factor here might be um, cost effectiveness. I mean, how much will um, this insulin product cost? Uh, could you just use normal insulin, I don't know if I'd be brave enough to do that myself, but um, there is a question, a question obviously about cost effectiveness, but if you really save four days of PN, that's probably quite a important cost saving. Um, but the study is underpowered for NEC. However, on the other hand, does this look like an intervention that might increase the risk of NEC? I would say probably the opposite, but we don't know that for certain. So get ready for more debate and discussion around the, the role of insulin um, in terms of um, you know, a bionutrient that might improve outcomes. Um, I'm not gonna talk about HMOs in detail because of course Janet has uh, talked about that. Um, so why don't we just add it? Well, there are no clinical studies as Janet said, and although it's likely to be safe, we do need to be cautious. As Janet also pointed out, DSLNT is one of the most complex um, to synthesize. And the enzyme that adds the, the last um, uh, molecule on is pretty expensive. So it's out of reach for a clinical trial. Um, and there are other HMOs around, particularly 2FL, that are much cheaper. Um, and then just, you know, my final sort of um, point about HMOs is, I mean, just to, to going back to what Janet said, you know, how is the DSLNT working? Um, and what Janet showed you was that the DSLNT doesn't seem to be utilized by the bifidos in the way that we might imagine. But maybe if the intestinal bifidos are not utilizing DSLNT for their own growth, maybe there's more of it left over to interact with the, the gut epithelium. Um, so how are the HMOs working as Janet suggested? I mean, are they actually working through modulation of the gut microbiome? 
or are they working primarily maybe by interacting with the gut epithelium if you go back to think of that schematic model i showed you about mechanisms so maybe hmos do their benefit by making your epithelium healthy and any impact on the gut microbiome is is what you might call an epiphenomena it's not actually benefiting the babies through the change in bacteria so clearly a lot more work to be done uh, fatty acid, so docose exonoic acid and arachidonic acid are considered conditionally essential in preterm infants. You and me can make them from um, our precursor essential fatty acids, but babies don't do that elongation very well. Um, and we know that DHA and choline intakes are often quite low. Uh, there's very strong evidence from basic scientific studies that um, DHA and choline might be beneficial for you. There are trials to show you've got to be careful here. If you just give babies extra DHA on its own, you may see slightly higher rates of BPD. Um, so this really emphasizes the importance of getting the right ratio between N6 and N3. Um, and that's something that Shahzia touched on in the PN talk. Um, so here's a bit of recent data from an Hellstrom Swedish group came out last year where they randomized 200 babies less than 27 weeks, so a pretty high risk group. Um, and they got supplemental arachidonic acid and DHA from day three versus placebo. And their outcome was severe retinopathy. And what you see here was a significant difference between the intervention arm, where they only had a 15% rate of severe ROP compared to 33% in the placebo group. And they also saw higher levels of arachidonic acid and DHA in serum phospholipids. And encouragingly, they saw no differences in the rates of BPD, IVH, or sepsis. And again, if you go to the right here, and you look at the orange line compared to the gray line, this is basically your cumulative risk of, um, of ROP. And I think we can easily be convinced that there's a significant difference here um, between uh, the control group and those getting supplemental fatty acids. So only 200 babies, I think we probably need to repeat this in other trials, but I think it really does emphasize that many of our babies may not be getting sufficient fatty acid intakes. Um, so what's choline? Well, choline is a sort of a B vitamin, um, but it also has lots of other effects. So choline is involved in methylation, so it's involved in epigenetic processes. Um, it's involved in neuro neuronal proliferation, migration, and differentiation. But importantly, you need it along with um, um, other compounds to make your phosphatid or choline. Um, so you need your long chain fatty acid and um, a nucleoside base and then choline as well. So you don't hear people talking about choline very much, but you find it in fish and eggs and meat and these compounds. And there's fairly good evidence actually that preterm babies are probably not getting enough choline um, in their diet. Um, here's a kind of just a very quick look at um, uh, choline in a term population. So this is um, really just to emphasize why choline might be so important. So this was a study in completely healthy babies where they gave mothers 480 milligrams of choline a day, um, which is the standard versus a, a higher intake. This is a very complex diet where they provided all the food that these moms were going to eat during pregnancy. That's why it's quite a small number. But what they showed um, very convincingly was that babies... Um, on the higher code, where the mums had a code, higher codeine intake, they have much faster kind of visual processing uh, reaction times. Um, that's quite impressive, considering these were completely healthy babies. So what we're saying here is that completely healthy babies benefited apparently from a supplement of choline. So if you then go back and think about preterm babies, you probably aren't getting enough choline. Maybe uh, this really is something that we need to, to offer more of. And this is the dolphin trial. This is the kind of pilot trial conducted a few years ago here, suggesting that babies who, uh, who are at risk of CP and had the supplement with D, uh, DHA and choline seem to have this higher or improved outcome for cognitive functioning at two years of age. So we're now repeating that in the dolphin study. Um, we've got about 30 units signed up um, and we're gonna be recruiting two populations. So those babies less than 28 weeks, and um, then also a second population of babies who have a brain injury um, and receiving cooling for HIE. And we're going to recruit a thousand babies. And the intervention is giving DHA choline um, compared to a matched placebo fortifier continued for a year of age. And the outcome is going to be at two years of age.
Um, so I've kind of lost track of time. Mark, can you just turn your microphone on and tell me how much time I've got left so I know how quickly to go? Um, it's difficult to know because you started, we were a bit late, but I think you've probably got another minute or two. All right, okay. So we've talked about these ones here um, and you know, I've given you some examples of, of um, some of the problems we're facing. I'm just going to finish up with lactoferrin very quickly. Um, as Janet said, it doesn't seem to work giving extra bovine lactoferrin. There are lots of mechanisms by which lactoferrin might work. Um, and here's the data from the Elfin study showing you that um, 10 years of hard work and 3 million pounds of funding gets you one decent publication and no benefit for clinical outcomes. That's pretty, pretty depressing, really. Um, but this is really just to explain the complexity. When you're doing a bionutrient, you have to go through all these complex processes of quality control and assurance. You don't have to do this if you're just using an intervention like penicillin or brufin. Um, we had to make sure that it was compliant with all the various regulatory diseases. We had to make sure that it wasn't contaminated in any way. Um, you have to make sure that it really is lactoferrin you're using. And when you buy this powder, how do you know that it's lactoferrin? You've got to think carefully about the iron binding quantity. If you use lactoferrin that's already got a lot of iron bound in it, it won't have the same effect on the bacteria. We had to make sure that it was coming from a country that didn't have any of these nasty viruses. And that turned out that it was only um, uh, New Zealand we could get it from. So we had to be pretty sure we weren't going to get duck viral enteritis or even Newcastle disease, which sounds pretty horrific. Um, and then this is really just to emphasize, these are here, eight different manufacturers of lactoferrin. And what they did was they looked at endotoxin levels and they looked at proteomics to see the different proteins there. And they looked to see how it was taken up by intestinal cells. And you can easily see that there's variability here. So depending on where you get your lactoferrin from, you might get a different effect. So if you're gonna do a big trial, which product are you gonna use? And this is true for any uh, protein, but it would also be true for um, things like bovine colostrum and milk fat globule membrane. I mean, these are very complex proteins and structures. So when you say, oh, I've done a trial of lactoferrin, it depends on you know, which, um, which one did you use? And then some of the problems we ended up in terms of trying to work out how to do this was, you know, what placebo are you going to use? So in the end, we ended up using sucrose as a placebo, um, but we had a very joyous day playing with various piles of white powder on the desk and seminar room with people wondering what on earth we were doing. So that was another challenge we had to get over. We then had to make sure it was blinded. Um, and we realized you could see the different colors through the syringes. We were doing this in 37 hospitals and therefore there were 37 different types of enteral syringes and nasogastric tubes, which made it quite difficult to draw the product up. You have to be inspected by the MOHRA um, and then you have to make sure you keep your unit cool enough. So it had to be kept less than 25. And all of you know that regularly the neonatal unit gets warmer than that. Um, and then as Chris showed at the beginning, we had first discussions around this at our meeting, entry meeting in Edinburgh in 2009. Um, and then you've got to work it all out, get all your approvals, do your recruitment and all your follow-up. And this is where we published the paper. Um, so given my age, um, there's literally no point in me having another good idea because I'm never going to see it through to completion. So bionutrients are very complex, I'm going to slip over that um, and just do my summary, which is that I think there are exciting times ahead. There are lots of um, biotechnology advances, um, there's some good studies, but there are important uh, questions around quality control, quality insurance. We need better tools to accurately diagnose neck and determine brain outcomes. Uh, we need bionutrients that are effective when they're added to a different gut milk matrix. So we need to know whether these bionutrients work effectively in formula milk or breast milk or both. And we need very large trials and nested mechanistic studies. Um, but we might not be just talking about bionutrients as supplements. As Janet pointed out, you know, the level of um, DSLNT varies in, in between mothers. And it may be that you can then analyze uh, donor human milk and you pick out the donor human milk with the highest levels of DSLNT. And that's the milk that you then give to your under 26 weekers. Um, and as I say, we also need to be aware of the longer term context of this and feeding over the first one or two years of life. But in all of that, don't um, ignore the importance of breast milk. Um, there's Janet on my website if you want to see what we're getting up to and get in contact with us. And then just to say thank you to everybody else, that's our website and my email if you want to get in contact. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nick, um, for stepping in there and, and filling the gap. Um, I guess we've got a few minutes for questions. 
if anyone wants to shout out or ask some questions. Uh, and we've got one in the chat to start with. Yeah, can you hear me? Uh, so, so the question was about um, whether H can can people hear me? Nod, Mark, if you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so, thanks. Um, was whether HMOs are affected by chilling or freezing, or the processes that donor breast milk undergoes? And actually, they appear to be relatively robust compared to other things. Uh, so, don't fear to, uh, appear to be affected by uh, freeze drying uh, or pasteurization which I guess is a good thing uh, and is obviously quite different than some of the other constituents that we might have thought might be a great thing to, uh, you know, use donor milk to provide to babies. So, yeah, pretty robust. Janet, do you just want to make a comment about IGA? Well, IGA is not robust in the least. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you halve your um, IGA levels by any of uh Fridging, fridging is that word? Refrigeration, that's probably okay. the better word. Uh, freezing uh, or passing it through a plastic piece of tubing. So any of those on their own will halve the level. So if you do all three, by the time you give it to the baby, it's kind of probably getting, you know, a tenth of what the mother actually produced. Um, so that's Claire Granger's work, which some of you will see. What we haven't managed to do is work out whether there are things we could do to stop that. So whether it's sticking to certain types of plastic and whether if you put your milk into something different, you can protect the IGA. Um, because secretory IGA is probably another key part of this whole, you know, how the bacteria are modulated and then the bacterial functional impact on the gut. Um, so yeah, they, they're not robust. It's not robust in the least. It's a fragile little daisy. Thank you. Janet, I think there is another question on the chat about whether we have understood why oh. mothers <laughs> can you hear me. I, I can hear you. So absolutely not. And I, I don't know if I made it clear, but we have several twin pairs where one gets neck and one doesn't. They've received their mother's milk. And when you look at the milk that the baby who develops neck gets, it got milk with less DSLNT in, having come from the same mother. So I, I, it's complicated, isn't it? Oh, something really weird has happened to my screen there. I don't know oh, if you I'm can gonna... still hear me. I can't see anything. Oh, I was going to chip in. I mean, um, overall HMO concentrations decrease a little bit over lactation, um, but it's possible that the kind of profile, I, the different types that are there are also changing. When people have gone to look and find out, you know, what is it about mums or mum's diet that might explain variation in, in HMO levels, there isn't really a lot out there. There's a little bit of something I saw recently about the amount of tea mothers drink, but that might be just an association rather than causative. Um, so it would be really interesting, wouldn't it, to know, I mean, is there a way that you can modulate mother's diet to impact on breast milk? We know that you can probably do that for fatty acids. You probably can't do it for proteins you probably can't do it for carbohydrates but there may well be some bionutrients other bionutrients that you can affect um potentially by mum's diet but i mean that work is in very very early stages so i don't think we know enough yet thank you nick and janet um i think mo had another question to the entire group actually whether fecal um cal protecting has been used or if any unit um has experience in using it uh, for screening tool for NEC. Um, it has been suggested in the SPGAM paper, I think. I mean, we are not using it here at UCLA, but I, I don't know what others have. I don't know which um, SPGAM paper that was. I don't, I, I'm not taking any responsibility for that. The problem with the cal calprotectin is that it only turns positive once you've got your gut inflammation. So it's not going to predict your NEC very well because you will get a positive result on the day the baby gets NEC. What are you going to do at this point in time? I mean, what you really want is something that might be turning a little bit positive three or four days beforehand. And then if you get a very high spike in that marker, you might decide to back off on your feeds or, I don't know, stop your feeds or, or do something different. Um but I mean, a calprotectin is a, is, a, is a marker of NEC. I don't think it's going to be a useful predictor of which babies. And certainly in your first few days, calprotectin levels are really high um, because the gut is getting used to a, you know, a kind of massive onslaught of bacteria and, and funny kind of nutrients. Um, mm. So I think early neck isn't going to be helped. I, I just don't think that people are going to make calprotectin work for neck. I'd love to think it would, but 
it just doesn't look like it will. Thank you, Nick. Um, and you you touched a little bit on you touched on uh, Colin in your talk and what is what are your thoughts and where how can we use Colin if it's beneficial and well again and there's a huge amount of complexity here because choline um as janet kind of pointed out co choline it isn't a nutrient that in preterm babies is likely to act on its own it, you know if it's going to do something useful to you it's probably going to need extra dha and ump and all these other kind of compounds so um there has been some kind of quite detailed work in in germany looking at it um i definitely think we're going to hear a lot more about choline over the next sort of five or ten years um, but at the minute, there just isn't enough evidence to, to you know, do anything clinically. Um, but it might be one of those kind of constituents of brass milk that is improved by mother's diet. Um, and so probably if the mother's, for example, on a vegan diet, I would imagine their codeine levels are probably fairly low. Um, I'm not saying you shouldn't have a vegan diet. I'm just saying that it might be a component uh, that is open to modulation. But it, it, I think it's going to be five or 10 years before we know enough about how to modulate that safely. Thank you, Nick. Janet, I think your comment about twins have uh, triggered more questions. Um, I think we'll give you some time to tell us what you know about that. It, so the answer is uh, there are all types of twins. Uh, so, so we've got some monochronic, some dichronic. Um, I don't understand it at all. I'm conscious when my video is on, you can all see my office and the sort of chaos in which I live. Uh, I might turn my video off. <laughs> uh, so, no, like, yeah, I, I, I simply don't understand it. So the, the important thing about the milk is that we salvage it. So it's milk that's gone through the process of getting to the baby, but hasn't actually quite got to the baby, if that makes sense. So we take the residual from the end of feeding systems. So bonus fed babies, we take the last little bit. So in uh, continuously fed babies, we take the bit that's trapped. Uh, so it has gone through something that the baby is a part of, and it's kind of attached to an NG tube that's in the baby. So whether there is some microbiomic thing that's doing something in the bit of milk that we extract, mm -hmm. I just don't know. But it's absolutely fascinating and very hard to explain, isn't it? Yeah, I think... I think the difficulty is that it's really hard to explain and in the practical in, in the clinical practice what do you say to these parents isn't it and it's quite uh, but it is fascinating I will I will fully agree um I had a question for Sazia if there are no other burning questions about what we do next as a neonatal community for um to eliminate the risks of PN but get all the benefits what where do you think we need to look into <laughs> next um, so it's a big area. I think um, on an individual unit um, level, I think looking, really scrutinising our processes and making sure that we're happy that we have everything in place is really important and that we're following guidelines and that they're reviewed regularly. So all of those steps, as just as individual cl clinicians, is, is really important. Um, and the thing that we've noticed on our unit is every time we have a change in staff, things like starting the early enteral nutrition, starting PN early, all seem to slip down the priority list. So we have to do a refresh every few months to make sure people keep on, on top of that. In terms of where we should go, I mean, when we've talked about this in N3 before, that we haven't really looked at the profile of the amino acids that we're using in our PN for a very long time. And we've looked at the options are starting at different points and there are different units that have different ways of introducing PN and using big data and looking at larger numbers might give us a, a more of a signal about that over time. But to me, if we're thinking about every individual baby, then making sure the composition of what we're giving them would probably be where I would like to start and, and take, it, take it from there. But again, that takes on the, the part of working with industry and having a really careful thought as to where we want to go. We know what things might be toxic or harmful in larger quantities, but we still don't understand what's missing that might improve things as well. So I think we need to understand a bit more about the PN we're giving and refine what we're giving um, in terms of the amino acids. That's where I think we would start. 
but it's open to everybody to answer that because there's many more people who've been doing this for a lot for a long time as well um i think uh, uh, yes that all very valid points as yeah and i think it's a it's a long conversation to have and something that the m3 definitely needs to look into um if there are no other questions i think we can break for until for five Ten minutes before we get to the workshops and hopefully we will be able to catch up with them um, time when we get to lunch um, if that's okay with everybody so have have you all back in 10 minutes uh, in your that should be back in your workshop so the allocations have happened and you should be having now your workshops um, to uh, go into after the break so 30 um, ten thirty-five. No, sorry, eleven thirty-five to come back. Yep. Is that okay? Yep. Please yep. reach out to the AV team if you M three AV or AV Tech if you have any issues, and we will be able to navigate. Thanks, everybody, for this wonderful morning. Excellent talks. Thank you.
Hi. Rakesh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Rakesh, can I please be put back into the workshop on enteral, uh, grading enteral feeding? Yep. Back to, there you go. Oh. Signing you now. Hi, if there's anyone else who needs to be in the workshop, please let me know. To join one of the breakout sessions, please message us. Hi, Rakesh. Uh, yep. uh, I need to be in that room, but with the privilege to share my screen. Oh, okay. Rakesh, I'm sorry, but I still don't have the ability to. It says host has disabled your sharing screen. Should we try it here before you send me into the breakout room? Go for it. So, yeah, now it's letting me do it. So, if you put me back in the breakout room, I hope it'll stay.
Hello. Um, sorry, I, I've I just lost my connection. I was in the bone mineral density workshop. Is there any chance of putting me back in? Hi, I've also lost my, my connection. connection. I'm on the on the optimizing feeding. Feeding. No problem.
Hi everybody. I hope you. Uh, sorry, we have. Sorry, we have some echo. Can you hear? Sorry, we have a speaker in the room. <laughs> Can you hear me now? We gonna yeah. um yes, wonderful. So we to catch up with time, we said we're gonna break now for lunch as I put on the message, and we'll have you all back by a quarter past one to go for the afternoon lectures. Unfortunately, um, Kathy cannot make it because she has other commitments this afternoon. So she apologized, but we will go ahead with the rest of the lecture. So it will be Mark uh, Johnson to do his um, lecture when we are all back. Thank Thanks, you. Christina. Thanks. Beautiful, no pressure then. No pressure then, yeah. Well. My, my technology has already failed about four times, so it's fabulous. I have two computers and a phone to, get, to see which one works. Well, I'm currently on an NHS computer, so you know I've already had it crash once because there was too much memory in use because it can't cope with Zoom and PowerPoint at the same time. Yeah, so we'll it's see what all happens. of the above. Yeah, it's, it's exciting when anything works, isn't it? <laughs> I suppose we all been through that. Yeah, I've, is, clo I've, is, closed, I've closed all my other applications to try and prevent that happening <laughs> during my time. Well, I know my work one this morning, which would have been the better option, suddenly announced because I've been there for a few days. You're over your limit. You're, you're closed. Game over. <laughs> oh, you're, that's kind, though. Is it trying to give you work-life balance by rationing the amount of time? I just you say you're off. It? Yeah, you're done. You're cooked. Go home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, yeah. Uh, great. <laughs> Are we, has the time gone? Should we? I think we can start. Nick's back, so that's probably. Can someone just check I haven't got any, any lunch left in my beard? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you passed the <laughs> Mr. Twits test there. Yeah, look, looking very well. Yeah. <laughs> we're all just very pleased that we're online and it's working. <laughs> um, should I attempt to share my screen? Yeah, shall I start? I should... Yeah. Yes, thanks. So, afternoon, everyone. Hopefully, everyone is back online and can hear us. Um, so, after a very thought provoking morning session, it's a pleasure to um, introduce the afternoon session. My name is Anne Hecky, I'm a neonatologist in Dublin. Um, now, sadly, uh, Kathy Grizzle is not going to be able to be with us this afternoon, but we still have a very uh, full program, and it will probably give us a little more time for chat at the end of the next session. So we're going to open up with Mark Johnson, who's an neonatologist in Southampton and is going to answer the very easy question of how much energy uh, do preterm babies need? Um, so I will hand you over to Mark. Cool. Thank you, Anne. Uh, everyone see that OK? And pass if I can get through the Kathy Beersville stage by moving my slides. Um, so yeah, thanks for that. So I'm going to talk about how much energy preterm babies need. And I could finish the talk here by going loads. But I suspect you want a bit more than that. Um, so, does that move? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay. So, I guess a lot of you may know some of this already. I know there's a lot of dietitians here today who probably can explain some of this better than I can. Uh, but we're going to talk about first why we need energy. So, um, you need it for several things. Probably the most important of which is to carry out essential work, for want of a better another word, that you need to stay alive. So, basic start tasks that have to happen at all times in order for you to continue to live. It's often referred to as your basal metabolic rate or BMR. And it consists of a few things. So one of the main costs of energy is membrane function. So that's keeping your sodium potassium ATPase that keeps the sodium on the outside of your cells and the potassium on the inside of your cells at all times against the gradient at which they would like to flow. Um, that has to pump those things in the opposite direction all the time to maintain homeostasis. One of the old nutrition lecturers here used to, used to light a candle back when you could do that on NHS premises and say that as the candle burnt down, that was his sodium potassium ATPase working. I'm not sure how accurate that is or how big the candle was, but you get the idea. Um, there's some mechanical what you have to do. So breathing um, is obviously important. You have to maintain your cardiac output and your vascular tone. That has a constant energy cost to you. And you've got enzymes and other proteins that you need to constantly turn over. Um, so these things have to happen all the time, regardless of anything else you might choose to do. And then there is some things that you might choose to do. Um, so these include physical activity, diet-induced thermogenesis, 
um, which is the energy you expend when you digest food, um, and growth, which obviously isn't a thing that adults do, although not in the way that I'm talking, they might grow outwards a little bit if they have too much, um, but growth is a thing very much that children do and is an additional cost to energy for them, and is a major issue when we think about preterm infants. Well, we just going back a little bit, the basis of recommendations for term infants was quite straightforward. Um, so what they did really was they back extrapolated from a group of, they took a group of 10 babies, this was many years ago, that were essentially following their growth charts nicely, looked at how much milk they were having through various clandestine approaches, like sucking the milk out of their tummy with um, an NG tube as they were breastfeeding, um, or giving their mother some sort of radio label to see how much appeared in the baby to work out how much breast milk they'd had. So they knew how much milk they'd had, they knew what was in the milk because they looked at it and they, 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 these were all babies they knew were growing well, so they went, well, that must be what they need. There are various versions, but essentially need about 110, 115 calories. So they, what they essentially did, you're all familiar with this kind of standard growth chart we're using in the units. They essentially looked at the right-hand side of the chart there or something like it that they had at the time and took the babies that were growing along their centile lines and looked at what they were all having. But you can't do that for preterm infants. One of the main reasons for that is that the left-hand side of the chart is not a proper growth chart. It's a preterm birth weight chart. So the lines are made by joining up the dots for all the babies born at 25 weeks, all the babies born at 26 weeks. And the reason that it's a birth weight chart is that's felt to be a good estimate of um, what your what in, in utero growth is. So we're taking the birth weight of these babies at birth to make an assumption about what in, in utero growth looks like to give a chart that represents in utero growth, which makes sense because I guess the aim here is to try and make these babies grow like they would if they were stood in the womb. And like I said, these in utero charts are not true growth charts. They describe size at birth only and not how preterm infants actually grow. If you do that, which Tim told you back in 13 with these rainbow colored lines here, he took the populations of babies born between 22 and 31 weeks in the UK, five years worth of data from Bagenet, the NNRD, and showed that they all fall down their growth chart. So if you did take the same approach with preterm babies, you'd get a very different growth chart and therefore recommendations that probably aren't optimal. So none of these babies grow to ideal and com more complicated, we don't know what ideal is. So when we think about preterm infant recommendations, we can't use those same assumptions. We can't assume what breast milk, that breast milk is the right feed for them. I and mean, we know it is for various reasons, but we can't assume that nutritionally it's the right milk for them. And we can't, we don't know exactly what ideal growth looks like, although their current aim is to try and get them to grow like they would if they were in the womb. So when people have looked at nutritional requirements in general, not just energy, they've used combinations of things like fetal composition studies. This was in the 50s um, to see what babies who um, sadly had passed away at or near birth um, were, were composed of to work out what you might need to make that. There's some nutrient turnover studies and clinical nutrition trials that have informed some data. People have looked at what's in core blood and people have done some extrapolated work from term and adult data. So all these things have contributed towards um, how we've come up with recommendations for preterm infants. They're often given as this reasonable range of intake um, rather than the traditional dietetic measure, which is reference nutrient intake, which is defined as the amount of a nutri nutrient you need to prevent um, disease or deficiency. And because we don't know what that might look like, we've called them reasonable ranges of intake over the last 10 or 20 years when we've been coming up with them as, as a group of neonatologists. Um, Espigam previously made recommendations in 2010 um, for what babies should have, and they said they need 110 to 135 calories per kilo per day, which, as you can remember from my slide two, two slides back, is a bit more than term babies who need about 110 to 115. But they've been revised for 2020, uh, or actually revised for 2022 because of COVID, it took a little bit longer, in a group led by Nick, um, and I looked at energy. So I'm going to talk about the kind of new recommendations for for energy, enteral energy intake for Espigan that are hopefully coming out soon, because uh, that was the bit that I was involved in most closely. So we'll go back to that basal metabolic rate. You have to factor that in when you're trying to calculate how much these babies need. And usually in, when it's been looked at in studies, it's estimated by measuring resting energy expenditure. So you can measure how much energy babies are expending. It's usually about 10% more than your basal metabolic rate. And it includes to add complexity, at least I found it complicated, the energy that you use to accrete tissue. So not the energy you're putting in the tissue, not what you're storing as your cells and as fat and things like that, but the actual cost of making that stuff. Because you're making that stuff while you're at rest and therefore your resting energy expenditure includes the cost of tissue accretion. So your resting energy expenditure will vary depending on how you're growing and what that growth is made up of. 
Your physical activity and diet induced thermodynamic are so generally assumed to be minimal and don't tend to form part of these calculations, partly because babies don't do a huge amount. I think physical activity is thought to be about 10% and the diet induced thermogenesis is even less. How do you measure resting and expenditure? En energy expenditure is complicated. The commonest method used in the papers that we looked at use indirect calorimetry using a machine like that one on the right there, the delta track. Um, this measures your minute to minute volume of oxygen consumed and your volume of oxygen carbon dioxide produced. And by looking at those numbers and knowing what's going into the baby, you can work out how much fuel they're burning and therefore how much energy they're using. And there are various sums out there. One of the ones from one of the papers that I used um, is uh, use this example, uh, example equation that your energy expenditure is 5.5 times your volume of oxygen consumed plus 1.76 times your volume of CO2 produced. So you can see how that, that sum sort of is going to give you a figure for how much fuel the baby is using and, and carbon dioxide they're producing. And generally, it increases as, as more nutrition you give. So the more nutrition you give, the more energy you're able to use because they'll start to grow. Um, and as you get older, your postnatal age increases, it tends to increase, which probably reflects a shift from the early postnatal phase where you're a bit unstable um, to a growing phase when you're a bit better. So what is the rest of the energy expenditure preterm infants? You have to know this uh, as part of the composition of, of all the different energies and to, to work out what they might need. And people have looked at this, there's been quite a few papers. Um, I pulled the ones that I used um, in this meta-analysis in this forest plot. So you can see there's about 10 or 12 of them. Um, that have been done over the last 20 years. The most recent was in 2018. They're all slightly different, as you can see, um, but they're all roughly between 50 and 40 kilocalories um, per kilo per day. They were all generally measured using indirect calorimetry. And if you put all them into a meta-analysis like I've done here and pull it, you can see that what it tells you is that their resting energy expenditure in the, and they're all stably and really fed preterm infants is just shy of 44 calories per kilo per day the reasonably tight confidence interval. Um, but this does not include the energy cost of tissue accretion, which I come on to. So when I put these studies in, I removed that. And so to, to cor I corrected for the growth rate. So this is just looking at that resting energy expenditure. But it will include an additional cost of about 1 to 1.2 calories per gram of weight gain, depending on how fast the babies are growing. And this is just illustrates that. This is um, a slide that I borrowed off Jack Rigo. Um, from one of those papers, a Bauer 2003 paper, and it just shows a nice relationship between those things. So you can see at the top here in the red line is the amount of energy babies being given in kilocalories per kilo per day, and along the bottom is their weight gain. And as their weight gain goes up, their, weight, their energy expend, resting, their energy intake goes up. And the blue line at the bottom here, you can see is their resting energy expenditure. So this illustrates nicely that as your growth rate increases, your resting energy expenditure also increases. Um, you can do a sum to work out the metabolizable energy. Um, so this is energy that's not lost in stool and things. I'll come on to that later. And you can see it it's works in parallel to energy intake. And the gap between your metabolizable energy and your resting energy expenditure is effectively what you're storing in tissue when you gain weight. So there's a nice paper from 1997 by Taz et al. that looked at the cost of energy deposition. Um, in preterm infants. And they what they did was they measured energy expenditure using indirect calorimetry, like the other studies, but they also did um, nitrogen balance studies to look at how much protein was being stored. And then they used some reference values for the cost of storage. I think they were from adults, in fact, the reference values, the cost of storage of tissue as protein and um, fat, and did some sums to calculate how much energy was being used for each of those proportions. They didn't measure the fat storage, they calculated the fat by looking at the total energy stored and took away the energy stored as protein because they had measured the protein accretion using nitrogen balance to work out how much baby energy babies were spending on accumulating fat. And what they came up with um, was that basically you spend 5.5 calories per, keep per gram of tissue that you deposit as protein and you um, put down 1.62 calories per gram of fat deposited. So protein has a much higher energy cost to accrete. This does not include what you actually store in the tissue itself. This is just the actual manufacturing process, if you like. So how much you spend on the cost of tissue deposition depends on what that tissue is made up of. So if we assume, for instance, that the new tissue is 13% protein, which is generally the accepted kind of target, and 20% fat, 
Um, this works out at just over a kilocalorie per gram of tissue. And you can see the sum there, five and a half, which is the cost of protein times that 13% gives you 0.7 calories. And you do the same with fat and get another 0.3 calories. And it comes out at just over a calorie per gram. If you go for a slightly higher fat deposition target of 30%, you can see it puts it up to about 1.2. So that's why on the previous slide, I said the cost of, um, if I go back to it here, the rest of energy expenditure was just under 44 calories plus one to 1 1.2 kilocalories per gram of weight gain. So that's assuming 30% protein and 20 to 30% fat. There was some complicated maths involved. I suspect a lot of you, I can't see your faces because I'm presenting a lot of people scratching their heads now. So, um, taking all that together, the important message is your resting energy expenditure is for, just under 44 calories plus one to 1 1.2 kilocalories per gram of tissue. That's probably the thing to remember. So that's your resting energy expenditure, 44 plus 1.2 times your weight gain. What about the actual cost of growing and the cost of storing it as tissue? So it costs you 9.25 calories to deposit fat as tissue. That's what's stored in the tissue. And if you store it as protein, it's 5.65 calories per gram. So that, um, and that comes from 1973 recommendations um, by the WHO who pulled a lot of data. I think a lot of it did come from adults. So the energy cost of the actual growth itself, the actual tissue storage, um, again, depends on how much you're growing. The current recommendations um, and the estrogen recommendations that are coming out will say that we should aim for about 17 to 20 grams per kilo per day. So that's what we need to think about. And obviously the composition will affect that. And I've said we're aiming for about 13% protein and 20 to 30% fat. So if we look at how we put all those things together, the different components of the energy required by preterm infants, we've got the basal metabolic rate, which I've talked about. We've got the energy needed to deposit new tissue. And you can put those two together and that's your resting energy expenditure. Then we've got the cost of energy stored in that new tissue. And if you add that to the cost to deposit new tissue, you can say that that's the energy cost of growth. And you can see how those two overlap. You can add all those together and that is your metabolizable energy. So that's the energy you actually need to do all those things together. So that's what you're trying to give. But when you're talking about enteral nutrition, you need to factor in the fact that you don't absorb everything that you take in and you need to allow for how much energy you lose in stool. So that will, if you account for that as well, then that gives you the overall energy requirement. And that's what the recommendations are trying to tell us. So which, what, when we put them together, what we're trying to say is this is what you should try and give babies to cover all of those things on that chart, on that slide there. So your overall energy requirement is your metabolizable energy plus the energy lost in stool. And estimates vary, but you lose about 6 to 12% of the energy in your stool if you're on formula milk um, and 14 to 16% if you're on human milk. And fortified human milk is probably somewhere between the two. So as a table here that summarizes all that, just to give you some illustration, um, this is obviously being recorded, so you can look at it later. But you can see, just as an example, if you aim for 17 grams per kilo per day, that's 13% protein and 20% fat, then you will spend 43 calories store in storing that tissue. You'll spend 17.7 .7 calories making that tissue. And then you can, which gives you a total cost of growth of 61.2. You can add that to your resting energy expenditure, which I've said is 43.9. It's the same for all of these which gives you a total resting, and if you add those two together, that gives you a total resting energy expenditure. And if you basically add the cost of um, growth and the cost and the REE together, so all these things added up, you get 105.6. So that's your, that's you can see I've got B plus C, um, gives you D and D is um, these two things added together. It is complicated, isn't it? Um, so you can see that if you, depending on the quality rate of growth and the composition that growth, your total energy required is somewhere between 111.9 and 160 calories, just because of the different compositions and the cost of doing that. So how much energy should we give them? So that data, like I've said, suggests you need about 112, 115 to 116 kilocalories per kilo per day, once you've adjusted for energy lost in stool. Um, which might seem quite high. Uh, certainly the old recommendations didn't go up quite that high, but you have to remember that that highest range of values that were at the bottom of that last table, we're assuming a 20 gram per kilo per day and 30% fat deposition, which is actually quite ambitious and perhaps not 
I mean, not, not the right sort of weight gain to be aiming for. 30% fat um, is obviously at the upper end. 20 grams per kilo is the upper end. So you probably don't need to go up as high as 146 to 160. Um, and there is a worry if you've got other things wrong. So if you're not got enough protein or things, that that might promote excess fat deposition. So it's likely that we can aim for a slightly lower upper limit of about 140 calories when you take that into account, um, which means that the recommended amount of energy we should be giving is between 150 and 140 calories. Lots of studies have looked at nutrient intake since the previous SPGAN study. So if we're trying to work out is 150 to 140 right? Does that feel right? Does it sound right? If you look at studies where people have tried to implement the previous SPGAN guidance, they all give energy intakes between about 110 and 140, with the mean protein intake usually between three and four, but it did go down as far as 2.6. Um, and if you plot those on a meta regression, you can see which I've done here, you can see that if you give energy intakes to, to achieve that growth rate of 17 to 20 grams per kilo per day, um, you and extrapolating that line on a bit, you need somewhere between 130 and 150 kilocalories, which seems to fit. So that's reassuring that we're not going mad uh, when we recommend 115 to 140. Just a quick word on protein to energy ratio. Um, we need to think about the optimal we, you know, we can't just give lots of energy without protein. We need to, you know, you want to accrete protein here. So you need to give the right amount of protein and you need to give enough energy that you can deposit that protein as tissue. So getting the ratio of the two together is right. Uh, we know that lots of babies don't. We know that as a group, there's lots of things, meta-analyses and such that show us that they tend to be smaller but have relatively higher fat mass due to a lack of fat-free mass when they get to term age. That's probably because they don't achieve linear growth as they should. And we know that pattern of body composition can have important implications for long-term health and disease. Um, and if we give too much energy without enough protein, they might get fat. And if we give too much protein without enough energy, um, they actually might be burdened by that in terms of having to excrete that protein. So we need to try and get it right. There's been a few studies looking at this that suggest um, that protein intakes around, I'm gonna skip for it a little bit, but it seems that somewhere between 2.8 and 3.6 grams of protein for every 100 calories is about right. This first study, study here shows that it didn't really matter whether it was 2.8 or 3.1, they got the similar amounts of fat-free mass accretion. Jack Rigo's group um, tried, found that giving a higher protein energy ratio of about 3.6 seemed to improve weight gain compared to 3.1. So we think that the optimal range is somewhere between those values, 2.8 and 3.6. And certainly if you go for the higher end of that range, you're likely to get improved weight gain and, and hopefully fat-free mass accretion. But protein energy ratio isn't perfect. Um, partly because it's a ratio. Um, so there's a slide to demonstrate that nicely um, that I've, been, I've borrowed off Christoph Fush. So you can see that the problem with protein energy ratio is that if you have very low energy and very, prote very low protein intake, you'll end up with a normal protein energy ratio and yet not be getting enough of either of those things to grow like you should. And equally, if you get too much energy and too much protein, you'll again, as long as they're in the right proportions, have the same optimal ratio, but be getting excessive amounts of fat, um, potentially, uh, so much energy potentially, and may get may develop adiposity. So the isolated use of protein energy ratio can be a bit unhelpful. And probably the thing to focus on is that you're getting both energy and protein within those recommended ranges. Um, but it can be quite a useful marker if you're concerned but it shouldn't be taken on its own. So in conclusion, resting energy for healthy creeds and growing piece of infants is about 60 to 70 calories once you've accosted, accounted for that cost of growth. So your metabolizable energy needs to meet your resting energy expenditure plus the need for growth and the energy lost in stool. And that we need to try and make sure we're giving the right energy in the right way, so the right proportions of fat and carbohydrate as well as protein. And the recommendations in the upcoming SPGAN paper is that we're going to suggest we aim for 115 to 140 calories per kilo per day, so slightly more than the old recommendations. Um, and energy intakes over 140 may be needed, um, and that can go up as far as 160, um, as long as we're giving the right amounts of protein with that. And provided that you're getting those things in the recommended ranges, we should be aiming for a protein energy ratio of 2.8 to 3.6 grams per 100 calories, with the caveats that I mentioned earlier. So how much energy is this? Um, so if you're a 70 kilogram adult, just to put it into context, it would be about 8,000 to nearly 10,000 calories. Um, you may all have heard Nick talk, um, it's really nice. He compares it to an average Tour de France ride on a mountain stage, we use about 8,000 calories, possibly more. 
um, I borrowed something from my research fellow and put it into burgers instead. So this is the Quadzilla burger available at any Hungry Horse pub near you. It's ridiculous. It's got two quarter pound patties of beef, two deep fried chicken burgers and all the other stuff you can see there. And that thing is 2,600 calories. I can just feel myself getting fat looking at it. Um, it comes with chips, obviously, which is another 700 calories. And of course, it comes with onion rings because why wouldn't it? Uh, and that's another 300 calories. So that total lot is still only 3,634 calories. So you need to eat it twice and probably have a couple of pints or something pudding to get up to that 8,000 to 10,000 calorie lot. So these babies need a relatively huge amount of energy. And hopefully, despite the complicated maths, you can see why that is. Uh, so I'd like to say thanks for listening. This is just a picture of all the people um, involved in the SBGAN um, vision of guidelines led very ably by Nick, um, who all contributed to some of the stuff you've seen. Um, they're coming up very soon. They're with JPGN, um, just going through the usual publication process of revisions and things, but hopefully we'll be out later this year. Um, and alongside um, a company called Future Learning, working closely with Nick and others to put together an online course about how they've been derived and what they say. Um, and it's going to look something like this with lots of helpful things about not just the recommendations, but how you might deliver them in terms of team working and things, things about non nutritional factors and our part of the guidance. Um, and all of these um, pages will be um, on that website and we'll signpost it through M3 when it's available. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, that was hugely informative and, and, and also clearly an enormous amount of work. So we look forward to the guideline on the paper coming soon. Um, I suspect as well it will generate lots of questions. I can see them beginning to come into the chat box. Um, so if anyone has questions, keep adding them. Uh, what, what I would say, Anne, is that I've got to go to clinic at two o'clock because I'm very oh, disorganised. Perhaps not So then. <laughs> I, if we've got time, I could take some clinics. Well, because uh, some we're ahead of now. time now. Yeah, OK. Um, yeah, well, we, we can take questions. some questions now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, what did someone, yeah, well, someone asked, you've already answered it. When can we expect the new SBN guidelines to be available? Um, so I guess in the next couple of months. I think so, yeah. Nick might be better able to answer it. Yeah, when the reviewers stop asking questions, but I mean, like, <laughs> maybe a couple of months. Okay. Uh, there's somebody another else? question um, yeah. Yeah, um, about um, weight loss. Does the baby lose weight uh, during handling by healthcare professionals? Um, Do we need to leave the baby alone? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I know the answer to that one. Um, there are people have done the studies looking at whether they, I think I, the most interesting one I saw when I was looking at all this was the difference between um, their position. So someone looked at supine versus prone positioning. I don't think they found a particular difference, but there may be something in it. Um, I think the thing important thing to remember about all these figures I've just shown is they're, there's, you know, they're from meta-analyses, they're from their, their average figures, so it will go up and down. I suspect handling doesn't have enough of an effect for you to think you should be feeding babies more for that are being handled more, but someone might look at that. Uh, there's someone called Louise Luis Marino who has their hand Louise up. Louise Marino, yes. I know her. <laughs> <laughs> really annoying person. Thank you very much, Mark. That's very interesting. Um, so I think the it's just maybe a word of, word of caution. So 160 calories per kilo um, plus your 11.3 to 14.4 percent if you worked it out that way would give you a well, protein energy ratio would give you 5.2 grams per kilo of protein so obviously when you're going to the extreme ends of protein intake it's just to be aware that that might have a negative impact on obviously your urea and as you know my favorite micronutrient is zinc so if babies are not going growing well with adequate amount of nutrition it's sometimes not because they don't have enough calories and protein it's as you alluded to it's the other micronutrient and I think the protein energy ratio is really useful because all of that work that was done by the FAO and WHO was kind of factorial analysis and if you don't have enough protein intake can you just substitute by giving modular additions and stuff like that you'll just end up by accreting fat mass as you said so it's a really important to have that correct ratio right otherwise you just end up with a fatty inside baby and not a strong muscly baby like a quadzilla burger um <laughs> Uh, so yeah, you're absolutely right, Louise. And I, I, we all felt, you know, when when I did that maths and we came up with an upper limit of 160, lots of us felt uncomfortable about the upper limit, which is why that's not what we recommended. We recommended up to 140. But like you say, if you're giving enough protein and you're struggling to grow, then going up higher towards 160 is is absolutely 
fine, we think, based on the data. But uh, yeah, you have to be giving enough protein with it or you will promote adiposity, you're quite right. And it, and you're right, nutrition is a complex intervention. Um, it contains lots of different things. Um, we all talk about energy and protein, but there's a million other things in there too. Um, and Nick's just very helpful put in the chat, which I meant to flag up, is that the protein recommendations have, won't probably change. Well, they won't change. So they're still 3.5 to 4. They do now say we can go up to 4.5, um, again, if needed. So again, going right up to 160 in that context is going to be perhaps not quite right. So it's, mm -hmm. it's about being mindful of the different nutrients. So you're absolutely right. Anyone else? I think we're good. Could I ask Mark just on, on, on that matter? I mean, because as you're saying, it's, it's, it's a bit about individualizing and going up to the top if you need to. But I do worry that, that it could be it could, it could, people could end up chasing calories and chasing protein, a bit like Louise has just said, and that you could, you could overdo it, that there might be a worry about that. Yeah, I, I guess that is a worry. And again, that's why we toned down the upper limit mm -hmm. to 140. And I think if you aim for that recommended range, I'm going to reserve the 160 for extreme cases. And it, if you aim for that, that should be okay. And it's not that different to what we were doing before. I think the previous up limit was one yeah. Um, But yeah, it's, people do, everyone looks at the energy and lots of people look at the protein, but you've got to look yeah. at the whole thing. You're quite right. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's really helpful. I think that's all I can see, Christina, uh, in the chat. Yeah, no, there's nothing more in the chat. Thank you, Mark. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And sorry that you Thanks have to go to the clinic. Oh, it's, a, it's my own fault. An administrative mix up. I didn't manage to kind of cancel my clinic like I thought I had. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. So, um, so the next talk is, is, is also very exciting. We're going to have two speech and language therapists, Katie Norburn and Sophie Phillips. They're going to talk to us about feeding challenges and some support in the NICU. And certainly in our workshop, there was lots and lots to talk about the need for a speech and language therapist um, and the work they do on the NIC nutrition. So I'm really excited to hear what you have to say. Um, so I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to try and share the screen. We're, uh, we're co-presenting from different parts of the country. So this might be a bit of a technical challenge for us, but hopefully it will work. Um, is that on the screen, Christina? Yeah, great. Okay, so um, just to introduce myself, I'm Katie Norburn and I'm a neonatal and paediatric speech and language therapist at University College London Hospital. Um, and, I, and I'm here to present with Sophie. I'm Sophie Phillips, I'm a neonatal and paediatric speech and language therapist at Adam Brooks Hospital in Cambridge. Um, and we're here to talk to you today about the role of the speech and language therapist on a neonatal unit, focusing on feeding challenges of the NICU patient and ways to support them. So many of you will already work closely with your SLTs, but for those who may not have regular embedded speech and language therapy input, we have expertise in assessing suck feeding. Um, we work with families as part of the MDT um, to maximize each baby's potential to establish safe and efficient oral feeding and enjoyable feeding. We may be involved a long time before a baby is ready to start feeding by mouth um, to enable parents and the team to provide positive oral experiences. Um, and we work with parents and the neonatal professionals to help everyone read baby's cues and learn how to support baby's early communication development. Um, the long and term, um, feed, long and long term and short term feeding issues can have a huge impact on infants, their families, and the NHS as a whole. Um, and some studies have shown that up to eighty percent of premature infants will have will experience some kind of difficulty with oral feeding during their neonatal journey. Um, while many preterm infants are able to achieve full oral feedings before they're discharged home from the neonatal unit. Many do continue to have feeding challenges at term equivalent age um, and beyond, and there is a disproportionately high representation of ex preterm children in feeding clinics. Medical complexity also influences feeding. Um, for example, those who have sustained a brain injury, um, the likelihood of feeding disorders increases with the injury severity. And neonates with congenital heart disease face significant barriers to achieving successful oral feeding as well. Um, and feeding disorder is often um, seen in amongst those who've had cardiac surgery as a neonate. Babies who've undergone multiple cardiac surgeries are at risk of developing later feeding disorders as well. Um, 
And a number of studies have highlighted that children with trisomy 21 are at an increased risk of feeding disorders, and there's a higher incidence of silent aspiration in this population. So that gives you an idea of what we're looking at, you know, why we do need to intervene early at this stage, because it can go on for a long time afterwards. So swallowing is a complex motor sensory task requiring the participation of 31 pairs of muscles, six pairs of cranial nerves, and there needs to be close regulation and coordination between aerodigestive reflexes. It's highly dependent on respiratory status. Oops. The um, structures and sensory receptors for swallowing are the same as they are for respiratory function. Um, and we as humans are generally hardwired for this. Um, in utero studies have observed that the pharyngeal swallow, one of the first motor responses in the pharynx, um, is, has been observed from around 10 weeks gestation. Um, by the third trimester, around 750 mils of amniotic fluid is swallowed in 24 hours. So the neural pathways for sucking and swallowing are very well established. But remember that breathing is the new skill for neonates, um, and that adds an extra complication. And if the movement is well coordinated and the structures are intact, then an infant can, call, can suck, swallow and breathe in synchrony. And this precisely timed magic um, enables a breath after each swallow that is adequate to reoxygenate the aerobic task of sucking and swallowing. So feeding can be impacted by deficits in any of these systems. Um, afferent sensory sequences allow for the appropriate positioning of the anatomic structures and allow for modulation of strength, velocity and timing of the muscle contractions during swallowing. But if any of these neurological systems, if the neurological system is damaged, then these sequences might be disrupted or Think of another system. So, for example, the um, if the anatomical structures is is different, then um, that will affect feeding as well. For example, if a baby has a cleft palate, for example, that will affect the ability to create that intraoral pressure that's required to make a vacuum for sucking necessary for sucking. So, speech and language therapists assess feeding readiness, um, and also we aim to differentiate between a normally developing or emerging atypical pattern of sucking and swallowing. Most feeding difficulties in preterm infants are caused by immature or inadequate coordination of the sucking, swallowing and breathing sequence. And there's a risk that these immature patterns become atypical if they're not supported. In cases of impaired coordination, liquid may be aspirated into the trachea and so into the lungs um, and aspiration might be demonstrated by choking, shortness of breath, disorders of the respiratory tract, decreases in oxygen saturation, apneas, bradycardias, but it may also occur with no immediately observable signs, so it might be silent, silent aspiration. And coughing and choking in preterm infants is quite rare, so it's not a common thing to see. Difficulties during feeding might lead to insufficient intake um, and insufficient intake, especially in the case of a newborn that's unwell, might lead to tension on the part of the caregiver. So it's going to make it a stressful thing. It's going, people want to get food into the baby. But tense interactions between the infant and their environment can be a breeding ground for behavioural and parent related feeding problems in the long run. And so for these reasons, it's really important to intervene as quickly as possible and to find out whether the problems uh, with feeding persist over time or whether they recover with support. And this list here is by no means an exhaustive or exclusive list, um, but it's a guide for the sorts of babies that we tend to see um, for speech and language um, input. Um, a quick note about feeding on non-invasive ventilation. Um, this is a hotly debated topic at the moment, and there are varying practices around the world. But just a reminder that infants with chronic lung disease are at more risk of suck, swallow, breathe coordination difficulties. Um, the respiratory suppression that occurs during a typical continuous suck burst may not be sustainable for the whole or even part of the feed, and the infant might not recover um, their respiration enough in between in the pauses in between and might fatigue before the feed is completed, before they've taken enough to sustain them. 
Um, they might try to take a breath early because they, uh, they are short of breath uh, before they've cleared the milk in their mouth. So placing them at a greater risk of aspiration again. Um, recent research has examined the practice of offering suck feeds whilst an infant's receiving non-invasive ventilation, such as CPAP. Um, the key points of these studies found that oral feeding while on CPAP does significantly increase the risk of laryngeal penetration and tracheal aspiration events. The pressurized airflow of CPAP inhibits the vocal fold closure and stents open the airways. Furthermore, the mechanoreceptors involved in swallowing are altered by positive airflow, which desensitizes and inhibits swallowing reflex, again, risking aspiration. Um, studies have shown that the more that suck feeding is offered whilst on CPAP, the longer it took to wean off respiratory support. Whilst it, when initiation of suck feeding was delayed until there were no long, they, the baby was no longer needing CPAP, Full oral feeding was achieved at a similar postmenstrual age. Infants on the neonatal unit are at high risk of frequent negative experiences, oral experiences. Think about all the different things that they've got going on in their face. They've been in, you know, intub multiple intubations, frequent repositioning of masks and tapes and all sorts of things compared to if they were still um, bobbing around in amniotic fluid. So this can result in sensory aversive feeding difficulties, such as food or texture refusals. Um, and these infants are at risk of persistent feeding difficulties beyond the first year of life. However, it has also been shown that delayed initiation and difficulties with early suck feeding can impact on caregiver interaction. So we do need to think about how that affects communication opportunities and the behavior the, between the caregiver and the baby overall. And we need to consider what other support we can offer um, to protect these. Feeding requires coordination of sucking, swallowing and breathing, as I've said, and it's an activity that's dependent on stable, effective breathing, breathing and overall physiological stability. Preterm infants and those born medically fragile communicate how they're coping and responding in the neonatal environment through their behavior. Um, we use Heidelise uh, Al's um, framework, the Synactive Organization framework, um, to look at um, how uh, to observe these behaviors and look at behavioral development. And this model describes the organization of the, an infant as systems that are four interrelated subsystems and um, looks at the capacity for baby's self-regulation. So these might be the, the autonomic subsystem, the motor subsystem, the state or behavioral subsystem, and the tension and interaction subsystem. Uh, subsystem. Um, infants communicate how they are feeling and their readiness for interaction through their behavior. Um, and these, uh, any change, subtle changes in the, um, within these systems uh, affect feeding. And so thinking about effective feeding, this model demonstrates what a, a complex task feeding is. Um, and it's dependent on a range of different factors that we've discussed. So as well as their physiological stability um, and motor and state organizational abilities um, that are required, feeding also requires co-regulation from the caregiver as well. So we need to think about the parental attributes or the person feeding them. Um, and they, they, this person needs to know what they're looking for before starting feeding, during the feed and after the feed as well. Better feeding outcomes are achieved when babies are fed according to the signs that they are ready. Infants also might demonstrate approach or avoidance behaviors and these should be observed and responded to. I'll hand over to Sophie to carry on now. Thanks, Katie. So, um, babies become more wakeful and start showing more feeding cues as they mature. And there's some aspects of that. You, there's nothing you can do to make it happen more quickly. You just have to wait for those brain connections to be made, and also for them to um, to recover from um, any medical challenges that they've had and as they start to feel better they'll start to be more awake and more engaged in their environment and um, so so 
the different areas um, and different subsystems that we're looking at that are babies ready to start having um, some opportunities to feed orally. Um, we'd want to have ticks in all of these green boxes. So is the baby having some periods of the day when they're awake um, or when they wake easily with some kind of gentle touch and quiet voice? And that's usually around times that their feed is due, but might not necessarily be. And can they maintain that wakefulness for five to 10 minutes at a time? Um, when babies having their care or cares or when they're coming out for kangaroo care and cuddles with their parents, are they able to um, remain stable during that time? So their saturation stay high, are their heart rate and their respiratory rate stable? Do they maintain a nice colour, steady breathing? Um, and, uh, um, and a kind of calm and relaxed and awake whilst they're being held and handled. What respiratory support are they receiving? So um, Katie touched on, touched on this earlier with um, when she was talking about um, NIV. Um, but are they, are they either self-ventilating in air or are they on low flow oxygen? Um, then they're telling us that they're ready from a respiratory point of view to start thinking about having some oral feeds. Is the baby starting to root either on, on the pillow, on the, bringing their hands to mouth, rooting on their fists, um, starting to kind of mouth against mum um, or dad's chest when they're being held in kangaroo care? Are they showing signs to tell us that they're hungry? If they're offered a dummy or a, or a finger, um, will they grasp it with their mouth and, and start um, sucking, initiating a suck burst? Um, and can they maintain that? And whilst they're sucking, either on a finger or dummy, are they able to remain stable? If they're doing all of those things, then we can start thinking about um, introducing some oral feeds. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, even if they're doing that some of the time, doesn't mean they're able to do it at every feed time. So we still have to reassess before every feed. Are, is the baby ready at this feed to start having a go, either with the bottle or the breast? Um, and if not, that's fine. Sleep is really important too, as we all know. Um, babies need to get into periods of deep sleep for growth, weight gain, and for their learning and development as well, and recovery. Um, but um, if they are awake, and if they're able to hold themselves in a nice flex position, keeping their arms and their feet and their hands in a midline position, can they stay awake and alert? Do they look like they have the energy for feeding? Are they engaging in their environment? Are they rooting towards um, the bottle? Are they able to kind of focus and engage with the person who's holding them? If yes to all of those things, then we can really gently um, offer a feed at this time. If we tick no to any of those points, then we might offer some non nutritive sucking, either with a dummy, if parents have given consent, or on a gloved finger. Sometimes giving non nutritive sucking helps the baby to become more alert, helps them to regulate and organise themselves better. And then we can revisit these same questions. Now are they ready to have an oral feed? Yes, then great. Um, if no, they're still looking kind of really low tone or still kind of glassy eyed, um, looking really quite snoozy still, um, then they can have an NG at this feed and we can reassess next time. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so you may or may not have come across the term homeostasis, um, but this is really about a baby being able to maintain stability across those different subsystems. Um, if they can do that during their cares and also with um, handling, coming out of their cot for cuddles and um, skin to skin, they need to be able to do that before we introduce the extra challenge of feeding. Um, and then, if, when they are ready to be introduced to breast or bottle feeding, we then need to be able to monitor them closely and um, and keep an eye on their their attempts at communication. What are they telling us with their behaviour that might mean they're either um, doing well and and maintaining that homeostasis despite the extra feeding challenge, or that we need to help regulate their behaviour. And help <laughs> Hi. Um, that we might need to change something that we're doing um, or give them a break 
or introduce some strategies to help them to regain that homeostasis or to maintain the homeostasis so that they can feed for longer. Next slide, please. Um, so what do we mean by, you know, what, is, how, is that baby, how do we know whether that baby is remaining stable or whether they're showing signs of stress and, and giving us clues that they're not really coping? Well, we can look at their physiologic signs. So um, throughout, before the feed, throughout the feed and after the feed, um, I would be looking at what their colour, what their skin tone is like, um, whether their breathing is regular or not, um, what their heart rate is doing, um, and any gastrointestinal symptoms as well. Do they look quite comfortable during feed? Um, are they having little posits? Um, am I seeing some gagging? Um, are they, you know, what, are they having desaturations through the feed, tachycardia, bradycardia? All of these things will tell me whether they're continuing to engage um, with the activity of feeding or whether they're starting to disengage and need something to change. Next slide, please. Um, so babies can also show us how well they're coping um, through their muscle tone. Um, at their posture and their movements. So are they, um, are they able to keep that nice rounded posture with their arms and legs tucked in or are they starting to become really low tone and everything's kind of gravity's taking over and um, looking kind of really low tone around the face, not able to maintain that latch around the teeth or, you know, are they, are they pushing back, straining, um, back arching, arms out, fingers splaying. Um, What's their facial expression like? Do they look nice and calm and relaxed? Are they making nice eye contact with me? Or are they, you know, furrowed brow, raised eyebrows, pulling away from the teeth? Um, um, how are they kind of physically responding to, to what's happening to them at that time? Next slide, please. And what's their behavior, what are their behavioral states like? Are they really nicely able to, um, transition in a smooth way from being asleep to kind of gently waking and being alert but calm um, and and transition smoothly between behavioural states or do they instantly go from deep sleep to crying and then quickly shut down because they're completely overwhelmed by their environment. Um, next slide please. And, and finally where, where is their attention directed? Um, can, are they, can they habituate to noises in the environment or does every time a monitor beep do they have a startle reflex because they're overwhelmed by things? Are they looking like, are they kind of pulling you in? Do they have that kind of perky look on their face and making eye contact with you and looking, um, you know, kind of really interested in what's going on with a relaxed facial expression? Um, or, are they, or are they kind of gradually sort of gazing off into the distance and... Um, and kind of looking like it's they're just overwhelmed with everything that's going on. Next slide, please. Thank you. So those are the sorts of things that we would be constantly assessing and constantly viewing, reviewing throughout a feed. Um, what do they look like towards the end of the feed? Actually, have we pushed them on too long? Do we need to make feeds a little bit shorter to make sure that they um, that it that, that it um, continues to be a positive and enjoyable experience both for the baby and for the mum. Is there any point where is, is something happens that makes it become stressful whereas before it was very calm and relaxed and safe and organised? Um, and then just thinking about, um, I think Katie said earlier on, you know, we might get involved actually way before the baby's anywhere close to being ready to take anything orally. Actually, from day one, there are things that everybody in the neonatal unit can do that will contribute to um, more successful oral feeding later on. So first and foremost, supporting lactation. I think we've heard so much in the talks about how important um, breast milk and express breast milk and colostrum is to these babies, but we need to, we need to be there on day one to help these mums with expressing and get lactation established. Um, offering buccal colostrum really early on so they're getting that really nice positive taste experiences. Of course there's lots of things that we have to do to babies to keep them alive and keep them well but unfortunately a lot of those things are, mean that they have negative experiences around their face and in their mouth so we need to find ways to kind of balance that out. Um, 
skin to skin care should really be the default option. Um, you think about how you're asking that question. I think about, you know, are your, are your staff asking that question to families and how are you asking that question? So rather than, um, would you like to hold your baby today? Like when would be a good time today for, for you to have your baby out in skin to skin? They being in skin to skin will help that baby to regulate their breathing, their heart rate, their body temperature. And if somebody else is doing that for them, it's something that they don't have to do. So it's conserving energy, helping them to grow, helping them to gain weight. We know that babies sleep deeper when they're in skin to skin. So that means that when they wake up, they'll have more energy to remain awake for longer and engage with their parents. When they're in skin to skin, they're also having nice positive experience around their face and mouth. They're smelling their parent. Um, close to the breast if mum is expressing they'll get that nice smell experience too. Um, providing comfort squares for when the mum isn't able to be there so if she wears um, either a muslin or a little comfort square inside her bra when she's not with them and the baby has one in the cot and then when she comes into the unit those can be swapped over so that the baby constantly has the smell of um, mum close by. Um, that was a challenge during COVID, but I'm hoping that those are now coming back again. Um, providing sensitive mouth care with EBM if it's available, or if not, then sterile water. Again, we want the baby's mouth to feel comfortable and moist and not become um, dry or sore or uncomfortable. And if you've got EBM, then again, they're getting those really early taste experiences and familiarity as well um, that, they, that they had experienced when they were in the room. Um, so as many opportunities for non-nutritive sucking as possible. If the babies, if the parents consent to a dummy, then the babies can have a dummy um, either during uncomfortable procedures, but also during tube feeds um, to really help them feel more comfortable and help with digestion. Um, and, and just having a look at the positioning in the cot, making sure they've got really nice supportive deep boundaries that promotes um, a flex position with hands up close to the face and mouth because that's really comforting for them um, and it can be difficult for them to lift those hands against gravity when they've got all sorts of straps and tubes and wires and everything attached to their hands and wrists. Um, this was a really, there was a really nice study done by Pickler et al in 2020 that just showed that merely providing some still positive touch during tube feed so literally just putting your hand on the baby whilst they were having a tube feed and not doing anything else um increased weight gain and also meant that the babies transitioned from tube to oral feeding more quickly which i think is incredible and it's a free intervention so we should all definitely do it um, and teach parents to do it as well next slide please um so I could talk about feeding interventions all day, but I think I've only got nine minutes, so <laughs> I'm going to have to whiz through this slide. But I think probably, de definitely there's some element of managing expectations about that transition from tube feeding to suck feeding. I think, um, you know, we're really good at celebrating every small bit of progress that babies make with moving on to breast or bottle feeding. But I think sometimes families think that um, once babies start feeding, we can go home and it still could be quite a long journey. It's a slow transition. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, I still do occasionally have, pet, you know, I go and see a family and the parents will say, oh, speech therapist is here. Can the tube come out now? I'm like, mm, not yet, but you know, that's the goal that we're working towards and it's a good one to have. Um, but we just might need to kind of readjust those expectations slightly. Um, we have a look at the environment. Um, is there anything we can do to change the environment to help the baby, you know, make it darker so the baby can open their eyes to help them engage and um, make it quieter? Sometimes I do even turn the parent, parent's chair around so there's fewer visual distractions for the baby. Um, sometimes we suggest, certainly in the early days of oral feeding, that only the parents offer the oral feed. Obviously that would happen if it was breastfeeding, but with bottle feeding, um, really that can make a big difference rather than having a different feeder every single time because that person gets to know the baby's cues and the baby's behaviour and is much more closely tuned in um, to their responses. We can look at timing of feeds. We work really closely with the MDT to see if there's anything we can change in, um, in terms of timing 
frequency and volume of feeds that might make a difference to how wakeful the baby is able to be, how well they're tolerating the volume of milk, um, how much effort they have to put in um, to oral feeding. We can look, we look at positioning and attachment, obviously in breastfeeding, but also with bottle feeding, just changing the baby's positions, support them, for example, um, with their motor skills, if it helps them to be more stable from a motor point of view, then it might help them to be able to feed more efficiently. Um, we definitely very frequently look at flow um, teat flow rate, um, but also with breastfeeding as well. So if a baby, we think a baby's overwhelmed with the a flow rate from the breast, we might ask the mum to express um, closer to a breastfeed, at least to start with the while the baby's learning. But with bottle feeds, we can try lots of different teats um, to reduce the flow rate. And if it has a slower rate of flow, then you're going to get a smaller bolus size with each suck, which gives um, the babies more time to think about what they're doing and they can be less overwhelmed by the milk flow. We can provide external pacing to make sure the baby's taking regular breaks during their suck birth. Sometimes they get a bit keen and do lots of sucking and don't stop soon enough to breathe. Um, and then they just get completely exhausted. So we help them to pace themselves more than they might be able to feed for longer. NG top ups are definitely our friend while a baby is learning to feed. Um, there's no pressure to start with, certainly for babies to um, complete a certain volume. We're really focused on the baby having a positive, um, good quality feed rather than focusing on quantity or frequency of oral feeds. Um, it's much more important to be to, to feed the baby responsibly. Um, they're not going to behave the same at every every time you offer them a feed. They're impacted on so many things that happen during the day. If they've had heel pricks or an eye exam or a bath or vaccinations. Um, all of those things can impact on how much energy they have for feeding and, and what their feeding performance is likely to be. Um, so, um, you know, it can be different. That it can be different at every feed. Sometimes our intervention is to do nothing. Of course, I don't mean do nothing, but a period of watchful waiting. If we assess them and say, "Look, I just, I really don't think that they're ready to do this right now. Feeding is too overwhelming. It's one step too far." We'll try again tomorrow. And really 24, 48 hours can make a big difference um, in how well a baby is able to engage with feeding and what they're able to cope with. Next slide, please. The last slide, I think. <laughs> um, so um, in summary, I guess, really, there's, there's so many aspects of, um, of a baby and the baby's family and the environment and the medical journey that they've been through that can impact on their feeding, assessment and intervention really has to be individualized to each and every patient. Um, we absolutely have to watch the baby and not the calendar. We can't make decisions about feeding based on the day, date, time, how, what gestation they are, how long they've been in the world for. It, we just have to look at the baby, assess them, um, and identify what, what their skills and where their needs are. And it's really important to consider the impact on the family, um, where the family are at um, emotionally and what they're able to cope with and what they're finding difficult and how we can how we can support them with that, because that can really impact on their relationship building with the baby and um, um, which, you know, and how they communicate with them and how they um, observe them and how they feed them. Um, Many of our babies do achieve full oral feeding before they're discharged home from the neonatal unit, but that's not necessarily the end of the story. Things can absolutely change. Um, they definitely around three months of age, there's big developmental um, changes and, and growth and anatomical changes as well, which can mean that where a baby was feeding well, when they left the neonatal unit, all of a sudden they're having um, difficulties um, maintaining their weight um, or their weight starts to falter and um, so a lot of these babies do need follow-up and close monitoring to make sure that they're able to maintain those skills and if they're not that there's um, a safety net there to continue to support the baby and the family. Thank you. Thank you so much to uh, Katie and Sophie.
Um, that was uh, fantastic. And, and uh, I mean, I think just explored so many things that we all see on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we have some time now for questions, if anyone wants to put questions in the chat, or um, if anyone wants to put up their hand to be unmuted. And I'm just looking. Can, uh, so there's the first question I see is, Sophie, can you discuss NNS on red green chart and what you look for? Um, so I'm not quite sure what you mean by the question. So NNS stands for non nutritive sucking. Um, uh, let me look at the question again. <laughs> <laughs> I, red, green, yeah. I don't I don't know what the red green chart is either. I, I so you so there was, so on one of my slides, there was a chart oh. where I said we want all the green bubbles to be ticked before we thought about introducing or feeding it. So I think it's that one. Um, so NNS stands for non nutritive sucking, which, it, yeah. which can be on a dummy or a pacifier um, if the baby has one, or it can be on a parent's cling finger or a member of staff's glove finger. Um, and and I, really what I'm looking for is that if you if you stimulate anywhere around the baby's mouth or the size of their cheeks that they're going to turn to that side and open their mouth to accept that finger or tea into their mouth um, and once it's in their mouth that they initiate sucking so so even if they can cope with non nutritive sucking obviously if you if you then introduce a bottle or a breastfeed you're then giving them the extra challenge of a milk flow so just because they can cope with non-nutritive sucking doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to cope well with nutritive sucking. I hope that answers the question. I think it does. I think it does. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so we have another question asking, here's a nice controversial one. Uh, do we not need to ask consent for pacifiers? <laughs> um, so in our unit, yes, we definitely do. I would <laughs> say it's an intervention. Um, there um, is mixed evidence about how, whether or not um, introducing a dummy impacts on establishing breastfeeding in term infants. Um, we would always, I would say 90% of the time parents just say yes. Um, we do sometimes get parents who are reluctant or who say, no, I don't want to. We would spend some time explaining what the benefits are of dummies um, on the specifically on the neonatal unit for preterm and sick babies, um, and then usually, again, most of the remainder parents will say yes, but occasionally parents say no, and that's entirely up to them. Um, you know, it's their choice; it's their baby. Katie, I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, I think every unit has their own policy. Um, an approach to that and um, if the parent declines to consent for that then we would really want to um uh, encourage them to think about the benefit as sophie said the benefits of non-nutritive sucking and um provide them with other opportunities so we might need to say that you, they, they really really do need to be there more um as much as they possibly can to provide this non-nutritive sucking um be it with their finger or an express breast or um whatever the baby is able to do at that stage but yeah thinking about how it helps with regulation it helps with digestion um we talk about all those things with the parents but it is their decision and the parents that we've encountered that decline to consent um have had quite strong opinions about it and they've read a lot about it and their you know their opinions are worthwhile and we do want to to listen to them great um anybody else and the other thing we had said and christina i see is online as well if anyone has questions from any of the other talks early in the morning because we have a little time to catch up on as well um in the meantime i i have a question just um well i have two questions actually but one um, for you guys is given that you're a limited resource and there are areas that don't really have speech and language therapists uh, with their services um, what would you say to what, what would you think are real red flags that you know should should encourage people to refer babies to a center with speech and language therapy early on so that it, it's not very delayed um, because you know it, it, it is the, the amount of provision is very variable and I certainly see this now in Ireland and I, I know I saw it in the UK um so who, who are the big ones we don't want to miss um i would say uh, all the babies that we discussed really um yeah. the 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 i think the, one of my 
first few slides had a, li a list of some suggestions of babies that do benefit from speech and language therapy. Um, mm -hmm. It's hard to kind of prioritize. Um, and I think what we would say is we value everyone else's voices in, in getting more speech and language therapists into these services. So talk to the commissioners, talk to your head of services and um, work with any speech therapists that you do have connections with to try and build the service because, yeah, we it does it does make a big impact long term. So, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, there is another question on the chat also. Babies are also refluxing. Any advice on positioning during feeding? So, so for um, we often talk about comfortable digestion um, positioning, and so um, it depends on uh, if this is a baby who is suck feeding or a baby who is tube feeding. But for tube fed babies, well, for most babies, we talk about um, skin to skin as much as possible, being held by their parents and being upright. Um, if that's not possible, if they can't be held during a feed, then um, we tend to feed babies on their side um, and making sure they can have their hands near their mouth um, and may maybe ever so slightly elevated, head, head slightly raised um, and uh, keeping them on their side after the feed. And if they're uncomfortable, um, say after uh, 20, 20, 30 minutes after a feed, um, if they'd been on their right side, which might help digestion during the feed, then turning them onto their left side if they're still uncomfortable. Um, I don't know if Sophie, you've got anything else to add for that for NG fed no, babies? I, think, I mean, there was, there, there was just that um, study that I referenced um, about, about providing positive touch. So yeah, absolutely skin to skin upright against the chest is the best position for feeding um or not in skin to skin if the parents aren't there and the nurses have the time to have them out and up and up in a cuddle um would be the perfect position um but if they if they're too fragile to come out or you or there isn't the staff capacity then providing that still positive touch can also really make a difference because it might be that that refluxing is a stress response rather than a gastrointestinal issue potentially um, and the only other one, I'm a bit tough, esophageal atresia obsessed at the moment because we've had a little run of them. So they're the only other ones that I, you know, their reflux is, is an esophageal, um, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> um, peristalsis. Um, I have a challenge with esophageal peristalsis, so their reflux is different for different reasons and you want to keep them in an upright position because they're really reliant on gravity to keep that milk down in the tummy so definitely for them being held upright um rather than on their side but uh, uh, flat in the cot but otherwise um yeah side lying um is, is another really good position and then the other thing i guess it, rather, not just about positioning but is the slow flow of feeds and um, making sure it's not just being dumped into them uh, by holding the tube up really high so making sure it's dripping in very very gradually and again parents have the time and capacity to be able to do that whereas i know it can be very challenging for nurses to to give to give a feed over the course of 20 30 minutes which would be ideal for these babies and the temperature of the milk would be, so I'm thinking we're, we're both coming up with things as we're talking, aren't we? Mm -hmm. but I, you know, again, ideally having the milk being room temperature, which is easier for formula because it tends to be kept out on the side, but sometimes express breast milk comes straight out the fridge, fridge cold and that, and that doesn't help either. Great. Um, what I would say is all of this conversation, you two are just demonstrating with every answer uh, the need for the resource that is a speech and language therapist. And I think just looking at some of the comments, so from Aniko, fully agree the speech and language input in these babies, full journey is preventative, supporting normal development. Uh, and it's way too late if you see red flags. Absolutely. We, I think we very much support that. So, uh, Christina fully agrees with that. And Anne-Marie Shine, huge issue on the wards with tube fed babies by gravity or pumps being fed in cots and not in parents' arms. I think what we're all, there's, there's a lot about resource, isn't there? And advocating for adequate resource, both at nursing level and speech and language level um, is, is, is very much um, an issue. Um, so I don't see any more questions unless anyone else has any. So pre-COVID, we were using some of our um, medical students um, 
to provide cuddle club for the babies on the unit. Um, so if you need a bit of extra capacity, that might be something worth exploring because they can come in when they're not um, studying or working and just hold the babies, having cuddles and giving feeds. Just touch, absolutely. Yeah. It's um, <laughs> yeah, well, thank you so thank you both so much for that. It was really, really lovely. Um, and it leads us on uh, to tea time again. So I think we're just going to have a 15 minute break, um, which should take us to, well, just about 50, uh, 1445 to restart the workshops, if my timing is correct. Christina, is that? Yep. Yeah, that should be fine. Um, yep. 40, by, yeah, a quarter to two, we should be starting the workshops. Lovely. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Hi.
Hello everyone. Uh, those that haven't uh, joined the group um, yet, could you let us know on the chat so we can assign you a group, please? Thank you.
Hello. Hi there. Which workshop would you be in? Yes, I think if you can put me in the rate of uh, increase of enteral feeds, please. I think I joined the right wrong group by mistake. Okay, it's the feeding one. Okay. Hi there, Asha.
Martin Tanis Fenton, who's a good friend um, and is by training a dietitian, um, but has also obviously done a lot of epidemiological work and is nutrition research lead in Alberta in Canada. And um, Tanis is well known for all of her sort of meta-analysis and work in nutrition, but particularly the Fenton growth charts, um, which I think are probably not widely used in the UK, although historically we did look at them. Um, but these have now been successfully um, updated over many years with additional data sets being incorporated. Um, and there's quite a lot of work suggesting that um, the data on the kind of growth of the Fenton chart may more accurately reflect the better brain outcomes than some of the other growth charts um, that are around. And Tennis, I've completely forgotten the title of your talk, but I'm pretty sure it's something around growth charts and whether it, whether it might improve developmental outcomes. So thank you very much for attending all the way from sunny um, Alberta, Calgary, and the floor is yours if you want to share your slides. Thank you, Nick, for the very kind introduction. And I'm uh, very happy to see you looking so well and uh, back at work, that's great. Yeah, so here's the title of my talk, Preterm Infant Growth, What Should We Expect and How Much Does Growth Predict Neurodevelopment? get these slides moving. Okay, so let's start with a quick poll. I have a lot of slides, so I'll just do them quickly. These are all true and false. The first one, most preterm infants are growth failing by discharge. So just make a note for yourself. I didn't set up polling. So true or false. Second one, preterm infant growth expectations vary by the prenatal environment, birth size, genetic potential, and NICU course. Number three, infants with growth restriction in utero have different growth expectations than those without growth restriction. And number four, most preterm infants should regain their birth percentile by 40 weeks postmenstrual age. So just put those aside. We'll come back to the same questions in a moment. So I'm going to address the second part of the objective first, and that is how much does growth predict neurodevelopment? And just like everything else in biology, it's a lot more complicated than a simple answer. So here's the growth patterns of our babies in our cohort study at a three years corrected age with low IQ versus adequate IQ. And you can see here that it's the blue babies that had the low IQs and the red babies with the adequate IQ. And what I think you can see is there's some differences, but my conclusion is that the growth isn't very discriminatory. There's a lot of overlap and there's not a lot of huge differences. We'll come back to these graphs and show you their later course uh, shortly. So in a, a paper we published a few years ago, we summarized what papers had, what studies had found about how predictive being less than the third or the 10th percentile, commonly defined as EUGR, is at predicting development. And all of the studies that were published over a, quite a range of years found no association with mostly Bailey scores, but some with IQ scores. And so there was, there was no diagnostic accuracy of having a low weight before 40 weeks for low cognitive scores. Now that's quite surprising, but I'll, I'll explain to you why I understand that that is. So the, the term extruderine growth restriction has been used a lot in neonatology and, and we actually have a nice exponential growth curve here showing how its use has increased over time with the highest year just last year. It's almost always defined the same as IUGR as less than the 10th or less than the third percentile, at, but sometime around discharge, around 36 or 40 weeks. 
So I want to tell you a little bit about our study that was published last year. And what we did that was different was we didn't just look at cutoffs of the third and the 10th percentile, but rather we looked at all percentiles. We, we looked at 36 weeks. And then we looked at the Bailey and we also looked at three year IQ scores. And I'm going to show you the IQ score data today. <clears throat> so this is our receiver operator characteristic curves. And before I get into the details, I'll just give you a rough overview of ROC curves. And because if you're like me, you don't use them all the time. So an ROC curve looks at the true positive rate on the y-axis and the false positive rate on the x-axis. And if there's no relationship at all, you get this red uh, a line equivalent to the dashed red line going from one corner to the other. And it shows that the exposure you're using is not predictive of the outcome at all. As tests are better, you get closer and closer. And if you have a perfect diagnostic accuracy, then you would actually not actually have a curve. You would have your results up at the point up at this corner. In reality, in medicine, the best you ever really get is, is up here in, in a curve like this. And the results are summarized in what's called the area under the receiver operator characteristic curve. And anyway, this number summarizes how high this curve is. And a good discriminatory test has greater than 90%. And this example here on the left has an area under the curve of 93%. A poor discriminatory test, this would be random, no relationship at all, is 0.5. So going back to our curve now, so we looked at weight length and head circumference uh, plotted on, on my growth chart. And you can see that all three of the curves over the whole extent of sizes of the babies at 36 weeks for every percentile gave a curve that's almost equivalent to the no relationship curve. Now it's kind of surprising because you'd expect, well, gee, the smallest babies must be doing worse. But we'll get into a little more detail. The 10th percentile is here and you can see that it, it's uh, for weight and it, it's, not, it's not up here. It's not highly predictive. And yet the literature keeps using that metric. So our area under the curves were, they were a little bit above 50%, but, but not much. So what we concluded from this is that weight length and head circumference at 36 weeks are not diagnostic of low IQ at any percentile, including the 10th percentile. We did a little more work and that was we included in our model, the important predictors in our data set of low IQ. And then when we included them in the model, then the curve increased up to an area under the curve for, for weight up to almost 70%. So what we can conclude from that is that what is predictive of low IQ at three years is the ver those variables that improved this, which were a low maternal education and brain injuries. So not too surprising that uh, um, a child's um, IQ would relate to maternal IQ and that brain injuries are hard on the brain, no surprises there. So I showed you these curves a moment ago and here they are showing you all the way out to 50 weeks postmenstrual age. And it's actually quite interesting because after term, not immediately after, but there seems to be a bit more discrimination for weight for the girls and especially for the boys after term age. And, and the head circumference for the boys even more so than the girls. In neonatology, we often see bigger effects for, for boys than girls. But then the question is, uh, so the differences became clearer after 40 weeks between poor growth and lower IQ. What could be the reason? And I think you're 
uh, conference has highlighted nicely what I think is the problem, and that is feeding difficulties. That in the NICU, we can support babies to do very well, even if they are have some impairment from, for example, uh, a neonatal brain injury. But after discharge, the parents have difficulty, you know, less tube feeding, um, the, the children are having to self-feed uh, 24 hours a day and the parents and the child is are having difficulties. And I think a, a difference from the assumption in the literature, is, the assumption in the literature is that poor growth is causing the poor neurodevelopment. But I think the order of events is the other way around, that the poor, uh, the, um, poor outcome is affecting the growth. So in a paper that we published two years ago, we summarized what aspect of growth is associated with poor cognitive development. And we found two aspects of growth that are very predictive. And one is the slowest growing infants, including Richard Ehrenkrantz's work and many other papers. And these are all summarized in the tables in, in the paper cited below. And also children who are smaller than growth chart curves after discharge, not at 36 weeks, not at 40 weeks, but after discharge. And I think what we can conclude from this is that growth rates and longitudinal growth monitoring are better indicators of long-term outcomes than one-time discharge anthropometric measurements. I think the one-time measures have become very popular because they're, they're easy to do, they're easy to summarize. So being an epidemiologist, I like causal diagrams where we look at what is, is the assumption of, of what causes what. And in the neonatal literature, the problem is usually assumed to be that poor growth causes poor cognitive outcomes. But, oh, and then the causes of the poor growth is assumed to be inadequate nutrition. And then the solution is assumed to be better nutrition. But I, propose to you that the whole situation is much more complex. And the problem maybe, or I think likely is that the actual determinants of poor cognitive outcomes are this list here. And I'll, I'll mention each one individually. And they are the stronger predictors of poor cognitive outcomes. And these factors also influence growth and size. And there may be a small association here, but and, and this is what's studied most of the time, but these are the important factors. So if nutrition care in the NICU is good, then nutrition and growth are not likely the cause of poor cognitive outcomes. And poor growth is only a marker of the poor cognitive outcomes to come. So social determinants of health, the WHO has a really nice web page summarizing these. You're all aware of them, it's, uh, but they aren't always articulated in neonatal research. Um, research. They include low income, low education, poor housing, uh, um, poor access to quality health care. Uh, those kind of things are very influential on health outcomes and um, they aren't always um, included in the studies. Prenatal factors are important. Uh, some women have illnesses or struggles during pregnancy, which can have long-term effects and it reflects not on neonatal care, but on uh, the situation that the women have in their health prior to the birth. Inadequate nutrition certainly can be a cause, but in probably most of your units, your nutrition is good and is not a cause of poor cognitive outcomes. And I listened to the excellent session on infant feeding that you know when infants really struggle with feeding, particularly after discharge, then uh, the nutrition can be inadequate uh, because of poor feeding. There's interesting work on NICU stress and how it has its effects. And of course, morbidities and the one that uh, keeps coming up in the literature is important for cognitive outcomes are neonatal brain injuries. 
So um, again, I, I'm recommending that rather than using just some summary that we that you look at longitudinal growth measurements. And the literature has really focused on this relationship. And paper after paper, I'm asked to review them. I see them cropping up everywhere. And for the most part, they the papers ignore these factors. So let's talk about preterm growth expectations. And the main point that I want to make is that there are a wide range of growth patterns uh, of preterm infants that represent appropriate growth. Here's the growth patterns that we published a few years ago of babies born between 23 and 25 weeks of gestation. And you can see there's no one pattern, rather there's uh, a lot of patterns. The background curves here are our meta-analysis that uh, we used to develop the, our growth chart. So my first uh, example babies for you are these two babies that were born appropriate for gestational age. How do you rate these babies as growing? How would you evaluate them? So I'll just describe them a little bit. They both lost some weight initially right after birth, and then they were growing approximately parallel to the growth chart curves. Their heads and, and length growth were a bit level for a week or so, and then started growing approximately parallel to the growth chart curves. So, and this baby, this little boy, his weight was above the 10th percentile at 36 weeks, and this little girl at 36 weeks, her weight was below. So I will share my impression. First of all, I would say that these babies are growing as many preterm babies grow and that they're achieving the ESPGAN and American Academy of Pediatrics goals. And so I would rate both of these babies as, as growing well. Just a reminder for you, the growth guidelines from ESPGAN and the AAP are to grow similar to the fetus. Now, some people say that that means they need to reachieve their birth percentile. I, I assume that what this means is that they are growing roughly parallel to growth chart curves. And here's some small for gestational age babies. How do you find these babies are growing? Now, this little boy uh, had a weight loss and then he was growing maybe even a little faster than intrauterine rates. His, his length is growing roughly parallel. His head circumference is coming up a little. This little girl, didn't lose weight initially uh, or much at all. And then she started growing and she's growing parallel to the growth chart curves. Her length is parallel, her head is showing some catch up. So how do you rate them? I rate them as they're growing very well. I'm very happy with their growth. And the baby on the right actually was growing faster than intrauterine rates and after the initial leg of, of growth, she actually ended up more than regaining her birth percentile before term age. So let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, a recent study out of Australia uh, found that small for gestational age babies are more likely than non-SGA babies to regain their birth percentile by term age. And they found that this was four times more likely among SGA babies. And we've found similar differences, slightly different numbers, but similar differences that because, uh, especially because of less weight loss and then more often a little bit of catch up growth before term, SGA babies often do regain their birth or more often, not often, it's still rare. It's still 19% in their study and about 14% in ours. And this is the uh, Z curves changes of their SGA babies and their non-SGA babies. And you can see that the SGA babies were not losing ground relative uh, to my growth chart, whereas the AGA babies were. Now, I, I don't find either of these average patterns um, concerning. This is how preterm babies grow. And I think uh, that it's important for us to be aware that the expectations are quite different uh, for SGA and AGA babies. 
And if that 10th percentile is, is used as a cutoff, a lot of SGA babies are less than the 10th percentile at, at 36 weeks because they would have to grow enormously fast to uh, be above the 10th percentile. This one was, this one was grown, at, born at the 9th percentile, so she didn't have that far to go to get above the 10th. But uh, this is, uh, being above the 10th at 36 weeks is asking a lot of a baby who is SGA. So here's another baby. This is an AGA baby born at the 60th percentile. And uh, her head was actually up at the 90th and her uh, length was just under the 90th. And she uh, didn't gain for a few days. And then she, she gained quite rapidly and she regained her birth weight percentile. What do you think of her growth? So I would rate her as growing well, and she's growing to her genetic potential. Uh, I didn't tell you before, her parents were very tall. So I would assess her as actually growth restricted. Now the norm, as you know, in neonatology is to use the 10th percentile for identifying who is growth restricted at birth. But if a baby was supposed to be uh, on the 90th or above, for example, and had some growth faltering in utero and was born at a lower percentile, she was actually growth restricted. And I would guess that this baby was growth restricted in utero also because she uh, regained her birth weight percentile. So she's growing like an SGA baby, even though her uh, birth percentile for weight was 60. So it's rare for non-SGA babies to regain their birth percentile, but it does occur occasionally, only among 6% of the uh, Australian study. So I wouldn't change her nutrition. I wouldn't consider her growing too fast. I would keep her nutrition as per recommendations. So here are two large for gestational age babies. How do you rate their growth? This little boy had uh, all three of his growth parameters above the 90th percentile at birth. He didn't gain for a little while. He lost some weight and didn't gain. And then he grew quite rapidly and um, he um, was growing slightly faster than the interuterine rate after 36 weeks, approximately equal to it uh, through this phase. This little boy, um, his uh, length was only at uh, the um, 40th percentile. His head was uh, the 55th. His weight was at the 90th. He lost some weight and then he continued to not grow at intrauterine rates. Now, an important fact I need to tell you about him is that his mother had diabetes. So uh, that's um, an important fact for you to think about as you evaluate their growth. And so my assessment is that both of these babies are growing well and their genetic potentials differ despite the fact that their weights were almost the same percentile at birth. The, the baby whose mother had diabetes, had some excess weight. And we often think about the excess fat that uh, a baby whose mom had diabetes has, but they also have excess glycogen and glycogen holds a lot of water, which is a lot of weight. So, we, we wouldn't expect him after birth to maintain the glycogen and the fat stores as they were supported in utero, but rather they would, would, would fall off. So uh, that's what his growth showed. So I would rate both of these babies as, as uh, growing very well. And I would keep nutrition as per recommendations for both of them. So some additional points I'd, I'd like to make, summary points that I was uh, making with those pictures was that, first of all, size at birth is a clue to how a baby might grow, but infants can be misclassified by that size of birth. And pregnancy factors can alter growth. I know you all know that, but sometimes I think we, we focus on everything that's happened after birth. And the, the categories of SGA, AGA, and LGA are arbitrary, and, and they can be wrong for an individual. We never really know a baby's genetic potential, but we can look at the growth pattern, we can look at parental heights, 
And then to set expectations, we need to consider any difficulties that the baby has experienced. And if they have experienced difficulties, we need to support them and uh, not necessarily consider that uh, they need to grow like everybody else. So I was giving you seven examples of good growth. Now I'll give you three examples of poor growth. So this AGA baby uh, was, uh, he, he had his weight at the 60th and his uh, head circumference just above the 50th. His length was at the 10th. So his, um, you know, it looks like he might have even had a little bit of possibly excess weight. I wouldn't ever put a baby on a diet, but he might have had some excess weight uh, compared to his length at birth. Then his weight just continued to fall away from the curves, particularly after discharge. So uh, this is a concerning pattern of growth, in my opinion. And it's a pattern that is associated with poor cognitive outcomes. Remember, it's poor growth after discharge that has been associated. And so which is the chicken, which is the egg? The assumption is often that it's the poor growth causing the problem, but I would suggest to you it's the other way around. And we need to think of these other factors as well. And uh, hopefully in research, these factors will be considered more. And so we get um, bigger, uh, better pictures in, in the literature. And perhaps the reason for his growth faltering after discharge is due to the adversity, which may present as poor feeding abilities. And a recent study that talks about parents, uh, that parents need more feeding support. I know this was addressed beautifully in the uh, session on, on feeding, but I came across this recent paper, which uh, also supports that point. And this is also by a speech language therapist, this paper. So what do you think of this baby's growth? So this baby was SGA and small for all three parameters. And then he just couldn't keep up with the growth curves at all. And I would say this baby needs further investigations. His growth patterns are concerning. Were there prenatal contributions that made him SGA? Or, you know, and, or has he been one of those babies that continually doesn't tolerate nutrition well? Does he have contributing morbidities? Or is there some underlying genetic or endocrine disorder? So can't answer the questions from growth charts, but his growth certainly shows that there is something concerning going on here. And baby number 10, this baby uh, was uh, um, around 60th at birth, uh, did fine in, in the NICU, but after discharge, his weight kept going up. His length was um, growing as expected. Um, we didn't have head, head circumference measurements after discharge, but the uh, main thing we can look at here is the length and the weight, and it looks like he has, well, I'll ask you, what do you think? And then I'll tell you. Uh, so this baby's mom had diabetes. And so he had, um, you know, some people might have thought he was faltering. He was down actually under the 10th percentile at uh, 36 weeks, which uh, was quite a drop for him. But his mom had diabetes. So I would accept that drop in weight. But then he had a high weight gain after discharge. So uh, I think the parents need support and uh, find out what. Uh, feeding goal they're working towards and uh, uh, perhaps they think he needs to be gaining um, you know 20 to 30 grams um, or more than 20 to 30 grams per day and uh, they might need their expectations adjusted a little bit. So changes in Z scores are becoming very popular to quantify growth. And I think they're becoming popular as people are recognizing that the 10th percentile uh, discharge aren't useful. But I have a few hesitations about using changes in Z scores. This paper by Neil Rojo, I think, is 
excellent for a, a few reasons. Uh, one, this graph really illustrates how preterm babies grow. Now, to be included in this study, babies had to have no prenatal or postnatal morbidities and minimal respiratory support. They were also in NICUs where they had protocolized nutrition, so the nutrition was probably pretty good. These babies showed the usual pattern of preterm infant growth of losing some weight and then starting to grow. The colorful shaded areas are the interquartile range, meaning that the bottom of this, uh, it's uh, the bottom is the 25th percentile and the top is the 75th. So I think an important finding from the, this graph shows us is that after the postnatal white weight loss of these very healthy, well-nourished preterm babies, 25% of them, their weight was below the 10th percentile. And so this reiterates that it, it's normal for preterm babies after the postnatal weight loss to weigh less than the 10th percentile. Not all of them, but a proportion of them. But what it, how else this study is important? they had documented or quantified that the average loss of Z scores from birth to three weeks of age was an average of 0 0.8 Z scores. And this and another study, and now um, I keep seeing people expecting all preterm babies to achieve this average achievement. But that's an average achievement. And even among this very healthy select group of preterm infants, there was a range of Z scores that ranged from a change of zero Z scores. Some babies didn't lose weight and, and some lost two Z scores. And again, these babies were um, doing well, didn't need adjustments in their nutrition. So I really think we need to be careful and not adopt uh, expecting babies to only lose 0.8 Z scores. Another concern I have with using changes in Z scores and using growth velocity, I'll illustrate here. And here's a baby who, uh, if you look at his growth pattern, I think he was doing really, really well as we'd expect a 27 week baby to do. If we look at week 35, he had a nine gram per kilo per day weight gain. And we'd like to see a weight gain in the range of 15 to 20 grams per kilo per day. So that wasn't a good number. And a change of Z scores that was a loss that week. So should we change his nutrition? Should we change everything we're doing for this baby? Well, I would say no, because the week prior, he had a 22 gram per kilo per day weight gain and an increase in his Z score. So I would argue to you that using these metrics in the short term can actually not give us the full picture of growth. We need to look at the growth charts to see what the full picture is. And looking at these numbers for a short period of time can, can lead to micromanagement. So I've become aware recently that in neonatology, what's done in research uh, to quantify growth has entered the NICUs. And I am proposing to you that the needs to assess growth in those two situations, research versus clinical care, differ. And for clinical care, we really need to assess each baby's growth individually. For research, there is a need to quantify growth for sure. And so we've outlined some suggestions in, uh, in our papers and uh, based on, on work that we, we have done. And ideally, if we're going to quantify growth and refer to growth velocity or changes in Z scores, then we really should ignore, uh, start that process after the weight loss phase. Because if we started at birth, then we're talking about, and we're talking about growth velocity, you know, 15 grams per kilo per day. 
we wouldn't expect the baby to overcome that postnatal weight loss. So I encourage um, that we begin at the nadir or what's a lot easier in research is to start at day seven. It's hard to identify the nadir for every baby in a, a data set, but day seven is easy to find. And then you could use changes in Z scores or growth velocity, the average or exponential. I discourage the use of the early method because it overestimates growth. And uh, I encourage that people drop the term extra uterine growth restriction because it really is a misnomer. I invite you all to enjoy our uh, international equivalent to your N3, which is song, or we've also called it neonatal growth. Uh, you can join it by uh, going to this webpage, and we're, we're hoping to. Um, try and do similar to your doing in your excellent group. We have posted the, uh, the guidelines on parenteral and enteral nutrition and on growth. And we've also uh, commented on the quality of the evidence, whether they're consensus-based or evidence-based and whether they're systematic and RCT-based uh, on that webpage. So I, and I welcome you to, uh, to join us there. And so let's come back to our poll questions. So um, grab your piece of paper and see if you change your answers. So number one, most preterm infants are growth failing by discharge, true or false? Number two, preterm infant growth X. Oh, and I can go to the answers for each one. I would say that that is false. Most preterm infants are not growth failing by discharge. And I actually um, dislike the even the term failing and, and particularly if parents are are told that their infant is growth failing I think that can be very very stressful number two oh, boop, boop, don't want to give you the answer uh, preterm infant growth expectations vary by the prenatal environment birth size genetic potential and NICU course and you saw the answer I would say that that is true that we can't expect every baby to do the same thing because they all have different situations Infants with growth restriction in utero have different growth expectations than those without growth restriction. Totally true. And most preterm infants should regain their birth percentile by 40 weeks. And I wonder if you agree with me that that is false. So take home messages for you today is aim to meet nutritional needs for all infants, aim for growth that is approximately parallel to growth chart curves. And always remember that there's biological variation and it's normal to see a, ranges, uh, a range of size and growth rates. And I will stop sharing and see if there is some time for some discussion. Alice, that was fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you. Very, very clear messages. And, and again, thank you very much for um, giving it your time to come all the way from Alberta to, to sunny UK. Um, before I go on to questions, I just want to point out that I got four out of four right. So people who don't think I know what I'm talking about, I definitely do. Because <laughs> I, I agree with Tannis Fenton. Um, and there were a couple of questions in the chat. Just before I ask them, I, I've got a very practical question which is how often do you think uh, we should be measuring the growth of babies on, on the neonatal unit? Um, have you got any tips about how people should be measuring length? Because I've seen various things out there. And, and who do you think should be doing this? I mean, is this the medics or the dietitians or the nurses? So just some very practical questions about what okay. you think of your, your unit. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I think, uh, <laughs> I think, the nurses who are the ones handling the babies are the best ones to measure in my opinion, uh, but anyone who measures, the only way to get a good length is to use a length board and two people. Um, as frequency, I think, you know, during critical illness, you're probably not going to change nutrition care depending on length growth. So, you know, don't even bother, you know, you want to measure head circumference to ensure there isn't uh, something going on um, medically with, with the baby. Weight, you know, again, during critical illness, it won't change your management, um, but weekly is, is good for, you know, when a baby is stable enough. Yeah. Did I answer all those questions? Nick? Yeah, you did. 
And then um, a question that sort of came up in the chat, and I'm just going to kind of rephrase it a bit. I mean, this is a situation of a breastfed baby who's grown, you know, what, what you would consider to be appropriate on the neonatal unit. And um, he's had breast milk fortifier and the mom is now breastfeeding and the baby goes home solely breastfeeding. And then you find out four weeks later um, that the growth is not kind of keeping up with your expectations. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the role of breast milk fortifier post discharge? I mean, is it being used in, in Canada? Do you think it's likely to have any brain benefits you're talking about? Reminding us that kind of poor growth post discharge does seem to have an important association, although that's probably mediated by feeding difficulties. Mm -hmm. What do you think about fortifier in the post discharge? Um, uh, I'm I'm not opposed to it, and um, you know it, it's used somewhat in Canada. Also, you know some um, some of the post discharge formulas added through breast milk are also used here. And I, I think it would it kind of comes back to the the same point I was making, and that is assessment. And you know, it'd be really good to see how the baby's feeding, and you know, if you could support uh, the the parents to feed more breast milk, um, uh, and then you know what it might actually be showing you more than anything is that the baby has you know, had difficulty in the NICU and needs more support. And, you know, they might even need, um, you know, some tube feeding once in a while. You know, I don't know what it is, but I, I guess my main point is uh, we need assessment before we can decide on the yeah. solution. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I think you, you kind of emphasized before the importance of the talks about feeding difficulties and, you know, how you can write the best regimes in the world but if you can't get the milk into the baby it doesn't it doesn't really matter so I think again it emphasizes the need to have multidisciplinary teams and really thinking about these babies and you know I've certainly noticed in my practice that you can get babies with um let's call it a brain injury and um, maybe these are term babies with HIE and you can make them grow on the neonatal unit whilst you're tube feeding them or giving them PN but when they go home they they can be incredibly difficult to feed and we shouldn't ever forget that that kind of post discharge period is critical, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. And and the burden on the parents round the clock. Yeah. And with a child that's hard to feed, they, yeah. they have a, a, an enormous struggle. Yeah. Yeah. And one very quick last question before I hand back. Um, you showed the differences between boys and girls. Um, and it seems like from, from the data that you have, that the slower growth in the boys in that kind of period, you know, coming up to term, um, may be due to feeding difficulties because the boys have a greater chance of having significant morbidities compared to the girls. But, but do you take anything from the studies looking at differences in growth or body composition between boys and girls? Do you think we need to be aware of any gender effects or do you think that's just... Mm garnish on the side. I, I guess my examples kind of I may have reinforced that difference and our cohort did show the boys struggling more and you know I, I, ours isn't the first one to show that 